Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's great to have you here. I must say, I couldn't be more overjoyed to have a chance to finally summarize after five great workshops. It's great to be at a place where we can actually put all the pieces back together again. But before I do that, I don't want to disappoint you. So I'll just tell you, we have to set this expectation. You can't summarize five workshops which had two hours of great participation by the students without having the students here, which of course many of them are not because of the fact they've got their exams and so forth. Uh, and even the videos and the slides that are up on the site now, that's gone live today. It's official. You can go find all the, the materials up there. Don't capture the true spirit which we witnessed over the last uh, six months or so. And that is obviously the engagement of the students. Uh, but if you'll bear with me, I'm going to try to at least give you a sense of what did we cover and a taste of some of the interactions with some uh, embedded videos. So with that, our agenda this morning is to cover those highlights. And uh, people said to me as I was going through these workshops, a number of different things that sort of really touched me. One was that the soft stuff is really the hard stuff. And what they meant by that was starting a company and finding the right team and figuring out how to really put that together with a kind of culture that made it possible to build a real company is actually really hard. And so I've heard that so many times now, I'm going to make a little bit more emphasis on that piece. The other thing I hear is that obviously when you take your product to market, all the things you hope for, such as everybody beating a path to your door because you've got the best mousetrap, don't really pan out that way. And so go to market scenario that people really want help with too. And that's why it's so great to have Jeffrey here today. Um, as you all know, because I've talked about it so many times, I'm a student of his and have really enjoyed learning from him. So it's fun to be uh, having him come up today and talk about that. But I'll cover some of those pieces again uh, in a little bit of depth today. We did actually have our award ceremony, but I just wanted to recognize at least a couple of people who are here. Uh, so we'll do that at some point. And then I, I need to have a few moments to thank everybody, so you'll have to bear with me at that. And then obviously it's on to Jeffrey. So about 45 minutes, we'll have Jeffrey. And I should say that although this was entitled the wrap-up for Jeffrey Moore, it's really the warm-up for Jeffrey Moore, as you'll see when he comes on. Well, we started out with a very simple thought, which is you can't start a company unless you have a value proposition. So everybody has to figure out you know, what their idea is and how to put it together. And so the first workshop was focused around what problem is it that you really want to solve? And then I wanted people to have, in the notion of teaching people to fish, an evaluation for their problem. And so we developed this gain-pain ratio over the, I guess, couple of decades in my various different companies to try to help that. And so we talked a little bit about that. And then out of that came people's value prop. It was very exciting in the workshops to see how many people came up with things that really refined both their thinking and also made us all pay attention. So there was certainly some great energy that came out of it. So let me tell you how we got there. Some of the highlights we picked out, uh, and I want to thank Adam Berry. Adam, are you here today? Yep. Uh, Adam helped me with some of this. I always think about things in very black and white terms. And so we came up with this um, moniker, which was the idea of really finding a problem that is blatant and critical, as opposed to latent and aspirational. Now, if you're a consumer marketer, you might actually need to go into this bottom left. But I'm mostly focused on B2B, as I've explained to many of you, as that's my experience. And we look for blatant, critical problems where people can really focus on what pain and need is just so urgent that you have to address it. So we talked a little bit about that. And we said, look, if you're going to solve a really fundamentally worthwhile problem, there really are at least four U's that we could think of. First of all, is it really unworkable? I mean, is something just fundamentally broken so that when you go in there, you're fixing something that ultimately delivers value right from the get-go? Well, better still, is it unavoidable? So, I know in the audience today is one of our companies that was a case study, Reval. They are in the business of actually providing derivatives accounting. And it turns out to be totally unavoidable because of the SEC and actually totally unworkable on spreadsheets because it's got so complicated. And by the way, it has a very urgent need because if you get caught out, as a few companies like GE did, it costs you hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of market cap. So the last piece became a whole subject in itself in the go to market, which is how do you find underserved markets and how do you segment them? We'll talk a little bit about that later on. We then went on to talk about what kind of solution can you come up with that's going to make a real impact. And we talked about this in some of the ways that I think people already know. You obviously want a discontinuous innovation. Something marginal isn't going to cut it. You also want something that ultimately becomes defensible and that is disruptive as a business model too. So the disruptive business model piece actually became a whole topic of itself and is the subject of a workshop. So we didn't cover too much at this stage, but what I was trying to point out to people is that actually this troika can make a big impact. And it's not just about technology, but so often when we're dealing with entrepreneurs and trying to help them get going, we find they always think about technology first 
But in fact, early on, if you can think about the business model and how to interweave it with your technology, it can make such a big impact. I wrote an article in case you're interested in a bit more depth on that that's up on VentureBeat that talks a little bit about why that's important to think about right from the get-go. And then as I said, what we try to do is give people a sense of what is the way they can evaluate their own idea. And the notion that if you can think about it in a way that actually brings it to life for the customer, then you're probably going to be uh, the voice of the customer and your own best critic. And I pointed out something that is obvious, which is obviously you want gain for the customer, but you've also got pain that they have to go through in many instances to actually deal with implementing their solution. And many people forget this. They think, well, you know, if I've got an incredible product, the customers will just implement it. They'll take it on right away. And the reality is there are a lot of things customers have to do to even find you if you're a small startup that are painful. They take time and energy and everything else. But the big one that I find people ignore and actually catch them out so many times is the inertia. And it comes from the fact that as a startup, unfortunately, you don't carry any credibility. You very rarely even carry any brand at all. Maybe you have some personally. And so this inertia is a big part of what we try to talk about. How do you overcome the do nothing alternative? Or if you're going to displace something, how do you make it incredibly clear why the gain of displacing you is worth the pain of taking that existing solution out of play? So I would encourage everybody here who gets a chance to contribute back because there was a lot of uh, this was all about us learning as much as we could to contribute back as the future generations, obviously, uh, of entrepreneurs come out. And I've learned a lot by listening to the, the workshops. So one of the things I heard time and time again from the students who were going through the gain pain evaluation is that they have a hard time actually putting this into numeric form, into you know, a scorecard, as it were. So we talked a lot about that. I won't go into it today, about how do you score this? How do you really get to a, a basis for evaluating? But in the end, I think we all agreed something which probably won't surprise anybody here, which is in many instances, unless you have at least an order of magnitude impact on your potential customer, you probably won't get over that inertia. You won't get over that risk that so many of them feel uh, is inherent in taking a startup into their organization. So I'm delighted to say that I wasn't doing all the talking. In fact, really all I was was a shell to get the case studies in play. And we had some great case studies. And I want to thank Apirian. Uh, some of whom are here in the audience, Carlos and Alan and, and uh, Reinhardt, thank you, um, who shared with us their own gain pain evaluation. And um, as an investor, I saw it firsthand. And I'll just tell you the, the pain to start off with, and then you'll hear the gain. When we first invested, they had a product which is going to sound obvious, which was an enterprise app store. And it turns out that enterprises don't want to put their apps on the iTunes store because they don't want everybody to have to go up there, use a credit card to buy them, especially if they're Procter & Gamble have tens of thousands of users, or one of our customers, Cisco, that has 60,000 users. They just want them rolled out to the sales force securely, et cetera. So there's a real need that they had, very fundamental. But they were having a problem with the pain that the customer was experiencing in implementing them, because they had to go through Apple, get credentials. Then they had to install the thing. It would typically take about 10 days. And that pain was so great for the customer to go through, we just weren't getting the adoption that people wanted. We were hand-holding them through it. And they literally sat down as a team to their credit and said, you know what, we're going to do nothing other than focus on live in five, building a product that you could literally go to on the web and in five minutes have your ups, uh, app store up and running and enable companies to instantly not only upload but then manage the entire life cycle of their applications for the iPads and iPods or Android devices. And their business took off, probably no surprise to you. But it was entirely because of them doing their own evaluation of this gain pain equation. And they gave a great case study of how Estee Lauder is actually getting 40% uplift at all of their stores, 17,000 of them around the world, by having this application for guiding people through what makeup they should buy. It turns out people trust iPads more than they trust humans. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, so, uh, and you know, great bottom line savings. And they were able to actually show those, you know, get those from the customer. So I, again, I encourage you to participate as we get into this in the future and bring your case studies forward because we all learn from them. Thank you, Apirian, for sharing yours. Now, I have to tell you, I learned a ton too. This was our Blackboard, that very board, uh, after the first uh, session, after everybody had gone off and done their workshops. And what I learned was something that I never expected because you know, I'm obviously a different generation to those that are coming up in this always on world. And it is that community is having more impact than anything else in this new world of you know, evaluating products. So I learned how important it is to think about you know, who are the influencers in your community? And, and we've all got used to now things like social reviews, ratings, and so forth. Uh, but it's obviously become an important part of the landscape as people think about you know, how do they change the buyer behavior. So thank you, everybody, who shared that. Uh, I'll incorporate it in future workshops, and it was a lot of fun. 
So we then went on finally to uh, company formation. Obviously those who had an idea had come forward and there were actually 10 teams who started out quite intensely uh, going after their ideas and many who couldn't uh, even, you know, we couldn't even get to. So again, I thank you all for stepping forward for that. And as I say, this was the softer piece that turned out to be harder for people to grasp. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on it and bring a few examples to play. And what we were talking about here was a framework for how do you build an enduring company? And people came forward with the obvious thing, which is, you know, okay, so you've told us what the value proposition is. What are some of the steps we need to think about along the way to realizing our vision of going and owning and dominating a marketplace? And of course, I said the obvious, which is, well, it's certainly not going to get done in four workshops. And it could be as simple as hire the right people who know how to execute, because execution counts for so much in this. So all the theory that I might share with you, I will say, it does come down more than anything else to hiring the right people and really having the conviction, passion, persistence, and everything else to go after pursuing that vision with the kind of execution that it takes to, to become a leader. But having said that, obviously it starts with people. So we talked about what is it that helps you get the right kind of people? And I'm a big fan now of not only Jeffries who helped me with sort of first ideas of how do you iterate things, but now people like Eric Ries have come up with the idea of pivoting, which Jeffrey and I were just talking about, is, is classic change in lingo, but it's really the same theory coming over again. But there's one area that I really firmly believe you don't pivot. And those who are in the audience uh, before will probably know it. Can anybody tell me what you wouldn't pivot in your startup? If you could keep it constant, it would really make a big difference. Anybody? Yeah. I wouldn't say a founder, co-founder. Founder, co-founder would be great. Change? OK. Anybody else? Change is, is, a, is, I would say, something that is a constant. So in that regard, yeah. Anybody else? Culture? Yes. That's the answer I was looking for. I'm not saying it's the only answer. All of these might be right. But the reason I feel that that's such an important piece is that it's really, really hard for people to join a company if they don't understand what the culture of the company is and what it stands for. And so if they do join it and it changes, guess what? They're probably going to leave. It's kind of like deciding that you're going to be a Red Sox fan and finding that the Red Sox all decide they want to play basketball. Yeah, probably not going to be great at it for starters, and it's going to be a little difficult for you to follow them. So we really think that cultural consistency, and we see it in our startups. Like, for example, the company we just took public last quarter, Demandware, it had the same culture from day one. It was very focused on making the customer successful. They even built it into their business model with a shared revenue model. And they really focused on it. So I was at their conference just yesterday, hundreds of customers and partners there. And that's the one thing you'd pick up if you went and talked to any of them is they know they have a shared success with us. And that cultural consistency went through everything, hiring, execution, vision, how they defined where they went with their products, the business model and everything. So I think it's a very big deal. And uh, now to make a little bit of fun out of it, I did ask in the audience, I made the mistake of saying, so culture starts with the word cult. So the question is, have you had anything to do with any cults? And uh, we'll see what you hear, you hear. It's OK. It could be, could be a simple cult. It doesn't have to be a <laughs> religious sect that got you into difficulty. What Rocky Horror Picture Shows. Rocky Horror Picture Shows. Can you say more, Tom? Yeah, we used to go at midnight uh, in San Francisco uh, with a regular group of people. And you'd celebrate by uh, dressing up and throwing rice and squirting squirt guns. And, how the hell did I hire you? <laughs> Too late now. So Tom is in the audience. Thank you for sharing it so uh, openly. But I really believe that culture has that kind of conviction behind it. Obviously, I remember the Rocky Horror Picture shows at midnight, too. I just wouldn't admit it. Uh, but it takes somebody of strength and character like Tom to be able to do that. But that is one of the things I think we took away from this workshop, is that if it's genuine, it really makes a big difference. Now, why is it important? We talked about this. Some of the softer things are harder to measure. So I tried to bring some research to bear. And actually, there's a lot out there. But I just brought some of the top places to work for from the Fortune Tech Survey. These are the top five tech companies out of the top 100 places to work for. And if you go and read this particular article or any other, you will find that these companies have distinct cultures. Google's culture is very distinct. It's very different, for example, to SaaS's culture, uh, which is you know, owner-run and owner-managed. It's also very distinct to Zappos, which is very execution focused. But the point is they all have a single culture. They don't have 10 cultures running around that company. And one of the points I wanted to make here was that it does make a top and bottom line or, in fact, genuine value impact. You can see these companies outperform their peers by 300%. So this might be soft stuff, but it makes a big difference. And so 
as much time as we get in the future to devote to it, I'm happy to spend on it because it makes a, a big impact. I'm not going to give Acquia a chance to recover from Tom um, because they actually went to the trouble of putting a video together to share with us what is their culture. And so let me share that with you now and you'll have a little bit of fun. Working at Acquia, it's very fast paced, it's very entrepreneurial, it's challenging and it's a lot of fun. Working in Acquia is probably the, one of the greatest jobs I've ever had in my life. Acquia's founding changed my life in a, in a pretty big way, of helping to build one of the you know, fastest growing startups in Boston. I came to Acquia because I saw uh, an opportunity that I hadn't seen since I got into this industry. You know, the opportunity of getting involved with a platform as um, significant as Drupal, as open as it was, with such a passionate uh, developer community. Working with the open source project, Drupal, is great. It is, it's really the highlight of the job. Just uh, felt like the right place, right time, amazing opportunity. I looked at the vision for Drupal and I said, this is the future, and, and I want to be part of that. So we're hiring like crazy, and um, it's a real challenge. The challenge of growing is, is making sure that we continue to communicate, we continue to find new great people. I think the important thing when you're hiring people, though, is to look not so much for raw experience, what does the resume show, but instead look at who they are as a person. Um, I think good people like to work with good people. Instinctive drive to accomplish something in the world, that passion and the smarts to go with it. I'm being with people that I like to be with who share the, those common interests, and that makes it a heck of a lot of fun. We're a company that has a, a very, very bright and promising future. We're enabling a lot of um, individuals and companies to do things that, that um, you know, they've never really been able to do before. So it's very exciting. It's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime chance. I mean, we, we're, we're on a company that is just it's a rocket ship. It's really a tidal wave that I'm happy to be riding. So thank you to the Acquia team who put that together. We really appreciate it. And I think however they did it, it was what they wanted. It was what they wanted to show. And so again, that's an example of a company doing something very specific to say this is our culture. Now for some of the harder stuff. Again, it's soft, but it's hard. And it's extremely important. I always hear from students, you know, we hear that people want to hire A players. What does an A player look like? And I'm always astounded because we see this happen over and over again. People hire on one A, which is ability. And I'm fine with that. There's nothing wrong with getting A players who are off the charts in ability. But I'll tell you, in my own experience, there are at least two other A's that are just as important, in some cases more important. One is aptitude, because it's so critical that people have the aptitude for what you're giving them an opportunity to do. Why? Because by the very nature of what you're doing as a startup, you are changing things. You're making breakthroughs, or you should be. And when you change and break through things, you're going to unknowns. And so when you're in the unknown, I don't care what anybody's abilities were in the past, what are they going to do when they're dealing with the unknown? They better have the aptitude. And then the third A, the attitude to deal with that. And so to me, the three A's are those three. And we talked a lot about that. And I then talked about you know, this new thing that's, well, I want A plus players. It's like, OK, there's always a plus. Even Google's got one now. So <laughs> what are the pluses? The pluses for me were three as well really authentic. You know, we talked about how many times people get foiled by salespeople. Salespeople are good at selling themselves. So guess what? In an interview, you probably will find out nothing of the truth about them, <laughs> unless you ask a basic question like, so what are your hobbies? Get them outside of what they can sell about and get them to tell you something. And we had some great examples that have come up in the workshops. In fact, one of the guys said, hey, the guy came to me with a, with a job interview for a job interview, and he read the spec so well. He sold me the whole spec. And then I asked him a basic question and, and said, why does he think he's a fit for it? And that was a great question. Of course, the whole interview changed at that point. So authentic, but awareness to me is the next key one, and in particular, self-awareness. If I observe one thing about the great entrepreneurs, and I would fall into this category of self-awareness after having learned all the mistakes of trying to think I knew too much and realizing how little I know. In fact, the older I get, the more I realize how little I know and how much I have to learn. It's that if you really are open about that, if you can say, look, I love doing these things. I'm passionate about doing X, Y, and Z, but boy, am I lousy at A, B, and C, and I need some help there. Well, guess what? You then open everybody around you to being able to team with you to fill in those attributes that can make you successful. But it starts with you being self-aware. If you don't know what your strengths and weaknesses are, that's OK, but I would encourage you to go figure them out. And start with something basic, like what are you passionate about? Because that tends to drive 
to you know, what you enjoy and what you do well there for. And then the last one was, was around this, what we talked about, CQ. Uh, if you get to the workshop online, you'll see more about it, which is really people like us, uh, the plus there being literally the acronym for it. In other words, are people going to be additive to your culture or dilutive to it? And obviously, if they're additive to it and they can really help reinforce it and drive it forward for you, that's a fa fundamental basis on which to you know, help getting the company's uh, focus of energy. But if it's, uh, it's dilutive, as we often see, people hire, for example, I've seen it too many times, great engineers into the organization early on who are off the, ch the charts in some dimension or other, but they have no interest in participating in the team. And they're dilutive to the culture because they don't want to deal with change because they think they know all the answers. You then end up with more problems than you can possibly get from the value of just their abilities. So this is an area that we'll spend more time on in the future based on people's feedback. At least hopefully that's a taste of it. So what were our learnings? Well, we had some great thoughts. Um, in particular, the audience gave us this feedback of, hey, you guys, um, does this apply to you know, hiring everybody? And I didn't really understand the question to start off with. But what came out of it was a learning for me, which is absolutely right. You actually should hire all your stakeholders early on. You should hire the first customers in the same way. Really be careful about who they are. Get the same uh, you know, out of your partners, because they're in many instances going to have to be aligned to in your supply chain or, or literally in, in supporting you in your um, you know, breakthroughs. And even your own stakeholders. And so uh, it's a little self-promotional, I'll admit, but uh, David gave us this uh, little cue after that came out. So. And we had about seven different term sheets. And so it really came down to us deciding who we wanted to, to work with. The deal process was really what gave us that confidence in terms of Northbridge. So in fact, we even took a low evaluation to get you guys. So. So I didn't know he took a low evaluation, but thank you, David, wherever you are. Um, in the front row. In the front row. Very good. Maybe you're going to claim it back later, so I'm sure we'll get, you'll get your own piece of this. But in any event, uh, we tried to help people boil it down to, so where should you start? We came up with a bunch of interview questions, and then I revealed one of my favorites, which is sometimes in an interview, if I really know I've only got a little bit of time, I'll only ask one question. And I'll keep asking it until I get to the depths of it, which is, what are you passionate about? Because as I talked about earlier, that will uh, so often signal people's real aptitudes and intentions, as well as obviously what they've got conviction to go after and pursue. So uh, it was a lot of fun watching people ask that question. Uh, I certainly remember one, which I purposely did not put on film, uh, which was a young lady being asked what her passion was and sharing it in a much more graphic detail than I think it was intended to be. Uh, but it led, it led to a date, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Uh, now, giving Chom a chance to redeem himself at this point, uh, he wanted to talk about what it meant for Acquia, so here's a little snippet of that. And it's something we look for in every candidate who is hired in the company, and it starts with passion, P for passion, and we want people who are really, you know, love it. I, I had a conversation with one of our people on our engineering team last week, and I asked him, he's been with us a year, I said, how's work going? He said, work? I looked at him kind of funny, he said, yeah, work. He said, I don't work. He said, I come here because I love it. And that's what it's really all about. None of us should feel like it's a single day of work. We've really got the true passion around it. Now, it doesn't always work out that way. We all know that there's parts of life that are, are the reality check. But guess what? They become trivial compared to what you're doing if you really have the passion around the, your full-time job. And Acquia has been recognized for it many times. Uh, but you'll now know that I switched from being you know, an entrepreneur to a VC, so I became a skeptic. So whenever I see uh, awards go up, I start worrying. It's kind of like you know, when people start buying buildings, you start worrying about that too. Uh, so I cold called somebody in the true style of you know, uh, Harvard decided it was important that we actually you know, cold call somebody from the Acquia team and figure out what they would say. Uh, and you see whether they uh, ended up reflecting what Tom wanted as a culture yeah. here. And Acquia has by far exceeded my expectations because not only can you learn, but you're expected to. And um, if I want to test something out, if I want to try something new, I'm empowered and encouraged to do that, and I love that. So I would say that's a great aspect of the culture that Tom probably would talk about now, which is it's a learning culture. Um, but we hadn't talked about it up to that point. And learning cultures are usually a great basis for people to feel good, too, because nobody wants to stand still in their career. Everybody wants to learn and evolve and grow. So it was great that she brought that out. It was a fun piece of the cold calling. I promise if you join my workshops, I won't do that to you too often. But we had a lot of fun with that. And thank you for the Acquia team for bringing so much energy to it. Then we moved on to the uh, more tricky subject of business model. This tends to be something that people say, oh, you VCs get all hung up on business model. I didn't want to get into the details of the business model in that regard. I didn't want to turn it into a financial discussion. Uh, but I did want to turn it into something of an agenda where people could understand 
how it could be something that made an impact in their startup. Finding something that could be disruptive, finding something that could leverage, as Jeffrey would say, the core rather than the context, uh, and that would bring some real truth to how you get advantage from it from what I'd call multipliers and levers. So we talked about it in the context of what's the perfect startup storm. Obviously, if you've got a disruptive technology and you can bring a, a breakthrough business model to it too, and then get really clearly defined uh, on a, really focused on a segment where you can uniquely serve it, you'll probably be in a great spot. And I challenged people, and I was very pleased in the workshop to see how many people came up with different business models. So a lot of people who started out with technology business models came back and said, you know what, we really have a data business model. So one of the peer-to-peer -peer companies, for example, was uh, developing a model around learning, actually realized that what their real value was was data. And we talked about some examples in the real world of how these companies have changed the idea of what the value of, of their real um, product or service is. And, and we'll see, for example, how that gets valued tomorrow with probably one of the largest IPOs we've ever seen in the industry. And it certainly isn't based around the idea of software, uh, which is obviously you know, how you might first experience it or encounter it. It's really based around a number of different things, such as the network and the power of the data that's producing. So I think that was a fun discussion, um, but it still turned out to be something that people had a hard time with. So we talked about you know, some examples. We tried to bring it to life with some examples about how could your core, where you really can gain competitive advantage, give you a basis to monetize your business, and indeed, where is it that you'll be able to you know, outcompete people? I dated myself. So uh, it just so happened that the week I was building this workshop, I got invited to the Symantec 20-year reunion for the people who'd been there for the first 10 years. So if you do the math, that's 30 years. It's kind of ugly. Uh, but it was fun. And I had my own first experience. And in fact, John Bruce, who's in the audience today, gosh, we're both dating ourselves that we know that. Uh, will have experienced this firsthand with me on the team that built this. So we were starting a business in the UK that at the time, I think we had 16 or 17 products across everything from Mac to PC, languages to databases. It was a tough business. We had a really hard time figuring out how to get above the noise. And then one of our sales guys uh, started to really kill it. And we found out all he was doing was selling one product, and it was semantic antivirus for the Macintosh. Because he realized, guess what? That was where the easy money was. People actually didn't want to lose their data and it became a whole data security campaign. And we did great with it. But we still hadn't really changed the game, and we still had a lot of competitors. And the thing that really changed the game was stopping selling software. What we actually did, and I can take no credit for it, because it was a, actually that same sales guy in the team who came up with this, was he said, why don't we give the software away? Because when the PC version came out, viruses did this. And in fact, the real challenge became, how do you keep up with the virus definitions? So this really was just a platform to get the virus definitions out there. The software was irrelevant. The really valuable thing was that subscription service. And if you look back at Symantec's business, you will see the inflection point at when that company took off was around this product and that change in business model. When we started selling antivirus subscriptions, the company took off like a rocket. We went public. We blew through a few hundred million dollars. In fact, it seemed like we just jumped to a billion dollars. So I'm a huge believer that this makes a difference, and that is not a unique example. We then talked about some fun cases where you could actually bring down to earth in the startup world uh, a real understanding of what would be the multipliers and levers around your core. And I won't go into this in too much detail, but again, it's up on the site if you want it. We talked about how can you get multipliers that increase your reach, get to greater coverage in the, in the base, and also you know, multiply your revenue. What kinds of levers could you employ that would reduce the time for you to take uh, products to market, your costs associated with supporting them, and the resources behind them? And we came to a place where we said, we need some examples of how those both could come together. And I brought up one of my favorite ones, which uh, again, I'd like to credit Jeffrey for, because we had one of our first discussions uh, in our conference room, where he looked at our product, which was in the analytics space. We did real-time inline analytics. But analytics is a tough space. It turns out, you know, it's a bit like an iceberg. We do that, and we do it incredibly well. We were unique in doing it, in the sense that we could build it in line, and we could do it real time while everybody else was doing reporting. But the problem is, getting the data there in the first place and organizing it in such a way that we could do it was a whole industry. It was ETL and OLAP and all sorts of other things. And Jeffrey helped me realize that and helped me realize how important it is to create the whole product model. And then, in fact, if we did it, we could just slip into a partnership and very quickly become, at the core, exactly what would change the game. And that's what we did. And we got some fabulous multipliers and levers out of it. Uh, in fact, we ended up being able to increase our revenue as part of a bigger solution, initially with Hyperion and then later with, with uh, IBM. And by the way, the end of that story is IBM ended up acquiring us. We got reached through their sales force and their channels. 
And we, of course, reduced our time to market, too, because we weren't developing the entire stack. We were only developing the core piece that we did so well. So again, thank you, Jeffrey. And it was a great example for the class. They all seemed to glom onto it. And we had some great case studies that came out of it. But I got posed the question, which is, OK, but how do I do that without giving away my whole value? For example, if I do an OEM deal, et cetera. And so to make it a little bit more lively, we came up with this uh, notion of what we call Russian doll packaging, which is there's lots of ways you can do this. You can actually build different versions of your product for different channels. You can also build them in what I call progressive disclosure so that users can have a first experience, a small taste that then they take more of, more bites of as they want to. But in the end, this idea of a Russian doll packaging model, I believe, is hugely powerful for startups. Trying to build everything right from the get-go in an indigestible huge product doesn't work. And in fact, it's not effective in going to market, and it's difficult in business models. So there's plenty of that on the site, too. And then other fun acronym. By this stage, people were getting to realize what I will now confess again, which is I was a horrible learner at school. Uh, had to create acronyms for everything. So mine for taking the friction out of products going to market was slippery. And as you'll see from this, there's, there'll be a, another post in more detail on it. The idea here was to come up with ways to make your product really easy for people to install, adopt, and integrate with other things and use so that it was obviously valuable and made customers just say, why can't I have this? Not why can I have this? Or why wouldn't I have this? And we brought a case study into play at that point. Uh, Demandware was unfortunately on the roadshow, so Jameis could sh share very little. Uh, we were in that lockup period. Uh, but he did share how important it was that Demandware created their own whole product. So for those of you who don't know, Demandware was the first company to create an e-commerce platform on demand in other words, as a service, so that people didn't have, as retailers, to take on all the pain of creating the infrastructure. They could get straight to working on what they do best, which is merchandising and marketing, and then using multi-channel, which is becoming the whole challenge for them. And they're not technologists. They're merchandisers. So that made a huge impact to them. But what we quickly found out was that, unfortunately, that means different things to different people. In fact, some people find it incredibly important that you involve things like power reviews down here, for example, or you have analytics for things like Omniture, and that there were all sorts of these systems that were out there. And in the back office, there were things like, obviously, how you dealt with tax and logistics and everything else. So even though we thought we had an incredibly complete platform, the ecosystem around us did not think that. And to their credit, the team responded very quickly to that. And I'll give you a chance to hear in their own words uh, how that played out for them. The early going, it was one of those you know, very shallow curves. And then all of a sudden, once you start to prove the value, it spiked quickly. And because of our disruptive business model of on-demand and shared success, another multiplier is the fact that because all of these technologies are revenue-generating technologies, it actually boosts another um, aspect up for the customer. As and yesterday, as I mentioned I was at that conference. There were actually over 100 partners that were there. And they actually were all bidding for spots to be at the conference paying us money now after years of you know, us having to do this to be part of this platform because it had reached critical mass. So it's really turned out to be a win-win, uh, in particular for the customer too. So again, just more examples of the whole product, why that's so important. And uh, for those of you who haven't read it in Jeffrey's book, you'll uh, find it in my well-bookmarked well -bookmarked, uh, piece here. And there's a really good description of it there. Now, I always wanted to position myself with one simple statement, and that was giving my entrepreneurs unfair competitive advantage. And so here's one of the things that I learned the hard way, which is it's great to have disruptive innovations. But if it's really disruptive to the point where customers have a hard time adopting it, that's actually a problem. That comes back to the pain question. And so I wanted to find an example of a company that actually had come up with a disruptive innovation but had made it non-disruptive to adopt. And in the bigger world, I think the best one I have is VMware, who really found a way to take utilization on servers from a few, you know, uh, into the teens, up into, you know, the 18, 90%, but without changing the applications, by just virtualizing them. And of course, there's some disruption involved in that, but it was minimal. And it's, to me, become one of the most valuable examples of this kind of innovation. In the startup world, though, I was challenged to find it, and Akeben provided it. So David, who had talked a little bit earlier, uh, is in the front row, shared his example of how They've been able to build one to two orders of magnitude in, in, uh, performance improvement for their customers without them changing a line of code in the application. That's a big deal if you think about it. And they brought it right to life by talking about one of their customers, Name Media, who has literally um, you know, got this challenge in spades because people were literally dropping out of the purchasing process as they went to buy domain names because it was taking too long to query whether they were unique or not. And now they've got it to fractions of a millisecond. Their revenues doubled. 
Now that is a non-disruptive and very uh, non-disruptive adoption curve, but obviously a very disruptive output. So we thought it was a great example. Thank you, David, for sharing it. And I hope there'll be many others. I'd love people to bring these forward. This is what this is all about, is learning from those. And we brought that right down to the thing that people spend most time on now, which is actually measuring the cost of acquiring customers and, and figuring out whether they're really in balance with um, the life cycle value that they get out of it. And we talked about it's not just lifetime value, because in almost all companies that I'm involved with, at least, it turns out it's as important to keep your customers engaged, and the re-engagement needs to be built into the process. In fact, I will tell you right now that having just been through three SaaS IPOs this year, one is in registration, that it turns out the most single effective point of leverage in the financial model is upsell. 2% increase in upsell in your model will generate about a 28% increase in your market cap. So this piece that I introduced to people isn't just fun to talk about, it makes a huge impact. And if you've got a SaaS model and you've got customers locked in and you can find a way to re-engage them cheaply, which should obviously be much easier than buying them in the first place or acquiring them in the first place, you can have a huge impact on your bottom line. So we talked a little bit about that and uh, we talked about therefore adjusting the, this to being a life cycle value of customer and the cost of acquiring and re-engaging or reacquiring customers and how important it is to look at both of those things. Now I have a company that is probably uh, by their own admission, in a, a relatively boring space. They're in the middleware space. You might say, well, how do you make middleware easy to acquire? And I really have to give them a lot of credit. So this was an example shared by Active Endpoints of, of uh, how they sell middleware in a slippery fashion and reduce the cost of customer acquisition. So in their words, uh, let me let them share that with you. Plymouth Rock Energy down in the New York City area traditionally had been an old mine supplier of coal and oil to uh, large facilities. Uh, that business isn't such a great business anymore, so they've transformed themselves into a broker of energy, including electricity and natural gas. Uh, and they use Salesforce.com for all of their new customer signups. So they had to customize Salesforce.com tremendously. Uh, when you sign up a new customer as an energy broker, you have to specify the supplier, who the distribution channel is going to be, whether they're going to pay a premium for green energy sources. Uh, and it turned out for the Salesforce.com users, the sales reps signing up a new a customer, it was a very complex process they had to go through the Salesforce screens. So we met a gentleman down at a Salesforce.com um, event in New York City on a Wednesday. The following Monday, we gave him a demo via a go-to-meeting, via a web meeting. Uh, he was able to get on our cloud-hosted product, uh, started building his little process wizard the next day that his sales reps could use uh, to go through this complex process of onboarding a new customer. Uh, by the end of the week, he had it working, and the following month, he placed the order with us. So, you know, going back to some of the points, you can probably map what happened there into these points, but installs easily. He was able to sign up on the web. He could prove value in just a couple of days by creating a wizard that walked their users through these complex um, processes. And uh, what else do I want to say? Plays well with others. Having the uh, Salesforce.com integration has been tremendously valuable to us. Mike, I would call it both a lever because it reduces our marketing costs tremendously. We know who our market is and we're able to get to them through Salesforce. And it's a multiplier um, because uh, we're able to uh, increase revenue by so many users. So I think a great example of a very tough space, and by the way, this is a company that's generated not six, but seven figure deals over the phone, no external sales reps, selling very complex middleware software. So they've actually cracked it. And it was through real focus on some of the concepts that we talked about in the workshop. So again, I hope some of you get to bring these examples forward and, and experience what these guys did. We then moved on to, to me, one of the more interesting uh, areas for startups, which is thinking ahead of time about their go-to-market strategy. Go-to-market's such a big area that I was very open up front. We wouldn't cover anything in the, in the full extent of it. But we talked about how you have to break down your initial cycle from awareness all the way through to purchase. We talked about what some of the strategies and tactics are, how inbound is now becoming popular, where that's appropriate or not, uh, and indeed what channels you might use to reach your audience, and indeed how you might segment and target your audience. And just share some highlights from that. I was lucky enough to have Adam Berry as our EIR here, and he gave a very passionate speech on the essence of brand. It's tough to uh, cut him to a few seconds, but I think you'll catch it in an essence here. It's a single core idea that unifies everything you do. Now, if you know Adam, that could have gone on. <laughs> but he did a fantastic job, and I thank him for it. 
uh, and it was really very passionately shared. And he did a fantastic job afterwards, too, of helping people think about what do they want to represent themselves as. And we got some great feedback from people. Again, people realized that suddenly brand wasn't just something that should be you know, written down as a single statement, but instead could really flow through things. So a single tidbit I'll share with you that was a learning that we discussed. I actually had it many times myself, too. Is a lot of people had a product that was called one thing, and they had a company that was called another. That's tough as a startup. Now you've got two things you've got to promote. If you can find one that lines right up from the get-go, it's an easy thing to do. You've now got one brand to promote. So that was an example of a learning that came out there. People had a lot of fun discussing it. Now a fun Harvard uh, case study. Um, you know, what's the two by two you can map yourself on? And we talked about this. Everybody has a positioning statement. Everybody wants to be in the top right and find some white space, et cetera. But what came out of the learning, which was really much more fun, was to define axes that really caused barriers. So usually what we see is wrong with the charts that come in. It's not that they're not beautifully diagrammed like this. It's that it becomes very easy for somebody to say, well, I'm faster or I'm cheaper or better. That's really easy for somebody to then break through and ultimately compete with you, especially as in many startups, you don't have the resources to compete with larger players. So they can easily just catch up with you. So we had a lot of fun talking about, well, what would be examples of barriers that you just couldn't cross? We talked about, well, you know, in this day and age, for example, cloud computing, if somebody's constantly having to install their software uh, to update it, then they're going to have a tough time keep, keep keeping up with you. And so we talked about companies where, well, where, where are there industries that have such fast moving change, for example, in regulations, that you have to have continuous innovation to keep companies up to speed. And therefore, if you have a cloud solution versus <coughs> an on-premise solution, you're going to have a barrier to anybody else chasing you. Um, and those are the kinds of things we were looking for. We had some great examples from the students. Uh, in fact, one of the companies came up with a brilliant idea, which was how to use downtime uh, from some of the, the suppliers that uh, were in their industry as a means to actually ca capture capacity and get scale for a startup that would enable them to compete with larger players. And then they talked about how they'd create a barrier by locking up the agreements to the key players that would enable it be, would make it impossible for anybody else to, to come in and play with them. So just some great examples, <coughs> and I learned a lot from that. Next thing we talked about segmentation, and um, segmentation's a, a whole science in of itself too, but um, there were at least three people who wanted to do mobile apps. Uh, actually, I think there were a lot more than that. And so I try to bring an example to life, to not to be brutal, but just to be brutally honest, about why that's a tough business. And especially in the B2B space, but probably even more so in the B2C, I just, that's not my particular area. And one of the people asked me to share an example of well, what might make a compelling mobile app. <clears throat> so what we did was we said, well, instead of just saying I've got a generic app that's interesting to uh, anybody who's got a mobile phone, what if you said, well, it's for mobile professionals, actually field workers, no, in services, oh, and by the way, specifically medical equipment that's sold to hospitals that needs to be serviced so it saves lives. Well, now I think you've got to a place it's pretty well defined and it's mission critical and you might have some value there. Turns out, by the way, that is a real case study for one of our companies called Antenna. Uh, which didn't get it right to start off with, but is now you know, the, the giant in that industry. And along the way, by the way, they consolidated $117 million worth of venture capital from seven other companies, sorry, six other companies to date, um, there'll be a seventh, uh, that uh, went to waste for the companies that had generic mobile platforms in the first era. And we bought them for, by the way, 12 million. So it tells you what happens when you get it wrong. Real examples of why segmentation is important. And then I shared something that I learned from Jeffrey a long time ago, which is, you shouldn't be afraid to focus. Jeffrey brings it to, to life in his book around building beachheads. But it's still a struggle for me when we listen to startups all along. And in fact, more so as I've come on to being a VC, is realizing people want to do too much. I would just ask you one question. Which would you rather, build on success or downsize and contract on failure? I'll tell you, unfortunately, we see the latter happening much, much more often than the former. And so if you could just start on one thing and get it absolutely right and target it in such a way that it can be something of a success, even if it's in the narrowest segment of one person and build on it, uh, so much the better. As Jeffrey will share with you, it's usually in many instances better if you can do that in, a, in an area where it can be referenceable and then build on itself through that referencing. So we talked a little bit about that and brought up the Demandware case study. And again, uh, I'll let them, uh, Jameis, the, the head of marketing, just share with you how he thought about it. Uh, and actually, a little bit of context here. So Demandware was in, a, in an, its early stage struggling with something that everybody struggles with, which is, okay, you have an e-commerce platform. Now, who do you sell it to? Do you sell it B2C or do you sell it B2B2C? Okay, which kinds of retailers do you go after? Do you go after branded manufacturers? Do you go after brands? You know, it was a big challenge. 
Uh, and I would say a big part of why we were successful at, at one point was through Jameis's uh, segmentation. How do we really focus in on a place where we can win? We thought about uh, not just even verticalized segments, but segments within segments within segments. And the particular segment, by the way, that really became so successful for us was really high fashion brands. Because guess what? They all love to talk to each other. They're very competitive. They will, for example, if you go down to New York, you can even geographically cluster them. And they have, in many instances, multiple brands. Like if you took Jones, the Jones Group, for example, they have many brands within that. And so it became a multiplier in our business model when he segmented it that well. Now here's another thing I find startups really struggle with. So we got into this in a little bit of detail too, which is in this funnel, people make the, the assumption that you're selling to one customer. And that's very rarely true. The guy who at the top is buying as a visionary is very rarely the same guy who's actually writing the check for you. Uh, he probably has a lot of people to go through. And along the way, you'll come across people who are technocrats, who are perhaps the DevOps people who have to implement this in the back office, uh, the influencers for political reasons, and ultimately people that obviously make the decisions. So we talked about how do you actually get the persona of those people into your buying cycle? Because I can tell you sitting in the boardroom, the number one issue that I'm always dealing with is the pipeline stuck. We can have that discussion in tremendous detail, but this will be one of the top reasons that will come up, is that people haven't really thought about who they're selling to and at what stage they are on the cycle, and what the value proposition is that's moving them from one step to the next. So it was a fun discussion. And then I brought out the truth, which is, unfortunately, you don't control a lot of this. And so the model I shared with people was, uh, it's really like driving, except the bad news is all you own is the gears. <laughs> the customers own the accelerator, the brake, and the clutch. And the reality is that is very much how it's true. And we talked about what are some of those ABCs, the accelerator, uh, accelerator brakes and clutches that the customer owns, and what are some of the gears that you have that can change uh, the momentum when the customer gives you the opportunity uh, puts the clutch in and you can change it. So it was a fun discussion. Um, what came out of it for me is that's a whole topic. Uh, we definitely you know, need to expand on that. Uh, and it'll be fun to do because there are lots of things to learn from it. One of the things I learned in the last uh, decade, and I'm sure everybody's seen the change, is the web changes everything. And it changes everything in such a dramatic way. In fact, it makes everything very much a closed loop. You can actually measure everything and you can close the loop and see what the impact is of what you're doing in campaigns. So we brought up uh, one, of, uh, one of my companies, Unidesk, uh, to talk about this. And um, actually, they gave a whole guerrilla marketing pitch, in my opinion, uh, which was great, because they talked about, even before they launched their product, how they started to create influence and uh, get awareness for their solution before they even had a product. And by the way, it was nine months before. Uh, so let me again let them share a little bit of uh, you know, their own voice here as to what they did there. The cool thing that, about Unidesk is that we have very passionate customers who want to tell their story about their success. It gives the customers confidence to, gee, if I go with Unidesk, I'm going to be part of this growing community. You know, listing of all the partners, ranking them, identifying who we wanted to target, how we wanted to message to them, how they performed with VMware, what our unique value was going to be. You needed to be crisp. You had to have your buyer personas baked. I mean, all of those things needed to be aligned. So it was, it was great fun doing that. And then we, again, boiled it down to reality, which is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And the new world, to me, it's about results-oriented, metrics-driven execution. And this is something that's becoming more and more a part of the challenge in marketing. In fact, we ended up having an inter Innovators and Entrepreneurs dinner around just the subject with a whole bunch of people from uh, the Boston area uh, to talk about what is the new challenge for CMOs. And what we heard at that dinner was something really interesting, which is CMOs these days are having to become almost data scientists as well as you know, uh, people who architect their own platforms for measurement. And there's a whole set of challenges now that just didn't exist. So I think this will be an interesting subject as it continues to emerge too. But Unidesk brought forward this incredibly detailed spreadsheet, which just went to the point of showing how much they measured. And again, in their own words, I'll let, let uh, them share with you what they think. At the end of this all is measure everything. Everything you do, you got to refine it, you got to measure it. So we've got spreadsheets, we track everything we do to refine that funnel. Then when you think you've measured enough, go a level deeper. Believe me, that is exactly right. And the number of times we've learned how we've got a sticking point somewhere because we actually didn't uh, measure it somewhere else. And actually, you know, if you move it one place during the funnel, you've got to figure out where the next blockage comes. But if you measure it everywhere, you can get to that place. So it was a lot of fun, and we ended that on a high uh, with a number of great presentations from people about how they take their companies to market, which ultimately came forward in the next session, and that's the pitch session. So as I bring this to a, a near conclusion, I do want to stop for a second and say thank you, because there were so many people who brought so many great learnings back 
both for me and for the audience as a whole. And that participation was really what this was all about. It was really about the workshops. So if I have any criticism of myself, and I'd like lots from you, it was that I'd probably cut the content in half next time and start the workshops with twice as much time. Uh, and maybe just you know, do more of them in, uh, you know, in, the set, in the coverage of the various different pieces if people want them. But love your feedback on that. And again, thank you for your participation. I want to thank also all the companies uh, from my portfolio and one who outside of it from the materials group, MC10, that came in to help um, to pitch their own experience. It was incredibly valuable. Frank frankly, for me, it was what the value was. I also want to thank all the mentors and coaches who were involved. Uh, too, too numerous to mention, actually, all the others that could be on this list, because a lot of people came in uh, on the evening and, and just jumped in. Uh, but I particularly want to say that one of the things that touched me here was that I didn't ask these people formally for their time. They kept volunteering it. And they kept engaging month after month. And in many instances, helped and coached behind the scenes as people started to put their pitches together. And I also want to thank the judges who um, came in. Uh, again, many CEOs and, and one of my partners. I decided we had to have a, one at least VC on there. Uh, he was quietly overruled many times, which was good. Um, <laughs> and uh, I loved the feedback. Actually, I thought, I will tell you, that the entrepreneurs were much more brutal about themselves than we would be. And so I kind of learned, wow, I think we should get more entrepreneurs into our partners' meetings. <laughs> I was learning a bunch of things there. It was great fun. So with that, let me share a few minutes of video. It's about five minutes of video because we couldn't obviously have the pitch competition today here to, for you to hear the pitches and the judges, and then we'll be wrapping up. Just what is it that you want to do? Well, we want to be free. We want to be free to, to do what we want to do. And for us, this core knowledge base that we're building up around user experience is going to give us important information on the multiplier side and drive engagement on the lever side. Really challenge yourself to think about what is 10 times better. I think an excellent pitch from Sarah. <laughs> so Sarah, you raised $16,000. Congratulations. My research at the School of Public Health is focused on infectious diseases and how they're transmitted among people. I think the value proposition and business model part on the health agency part was very clear. It was how you define the white space because that, it, it seemed, it really made sense. But I do think that there's an opportunity for you to, to package that information up and slice it and dice it in a way that's meaningful to the potential customer. Next, Regina. You raised $48,000 and with a cold. Imagine what you can do when you're healthy. Fantastic job. When you look around today in this room and you look and you ask, what's the most uh, amazing technology in the room? I think the answer is right in front of us. It's biology. Because these are the most advanced machines that exist in the world. It certainly seemed to me like the idea was compelling in terms of value delivered to society as a whole. Where I had trouble figuring out is how does that value accrual break down in different segments? I mean, first of all, that was great. <laughs> and certainly, um, uh, you might have cornered the big idea market uh, here today. So uh, de definitely, I, I love the fact that the second round is 25 million. That, that's one for Northbridge. Eric Kelsick. Eric, you raised $39,000. Congratulations. And to that question you raised, may you find a way to answer it. That's quite inspiring. So I'm Catherine Wolf, and I'll be sharing with you OrganJet, uh, just to tell you in one sentence what we do. So OrganJet uh, helps patients um, get organ transplants faster, um, that saves lives, uh, saves money, uh, increases, uh, improves efficiency by increasing the supply of transplants um, through the creation of a, a profitable business. I thought you did an excellent job there. There was no question in my mind what the problem that you're solving is. Uh, this team, and again, you oriented us very well with the team. This is the team that's a credible team to solve this problem. There were a lot of really detailed slides in the problem statement, and I bought into it right away. I didn't need the extra six slides to go through the problem statement. I'll be really impatient while you're going through the six slides telling me the problem over and over again, as opposed to getting into these questions. So, of course, I'm more patient than a VC. <laughs> of course you are. I'll step back. <laughs> Our team of Catherine and Cecilia, you raised $58,000. Congratulations, you guys. May one day that be real money and be saving real lives. So to analyze the market, 
we found that the market opportunity, there is less than 10% of grants get funded in the scientific community. The second thing, there are around 40% of scientists' time spent submitting these grants. So there's a lot of wasting time for the scientists uh, trying to do that. So uh, the way we envision post for is creating a fourth channel for the researcher to crowdfund their, their ideas through the public. It was uh, beautifully presented really tremendous ways that the service that you're talking about could gain significant revenue traction and provide a tremendous service for researchers in getting their projects funded more swiftly. So far, uh, you know, we've seen someone with a new, uh, you know, desktop or info worker productivity tool. We've seen a social media community health data play. Uh, we've seen something that had to do with um, bioengineering. Um, and now we're on to crowdsourcing. Our winner this evening, Ahmed, $69,000. Come on up. And three tickets. May the Red Sox thrash the Yankees in your honor. Congratulations. So congratulations to all of you, and thank you very much. So now we have at least a couple of our uh, winners here. So Sarah, I'd love you to come up and uh, receive your book from Jeffrey, oh, and he'll get a chance to sign you a note a little later on. Congratulations. Way to go. And Regina, are you still here? Congratulations, Regina. So unfortunately, we don't have our other winners here. Is, is uh, somebody showed up? Ahmed's here? Oh, fantastic. Sorry, one more. Ahmed, please come on up as the ultimate winner, too. I have one question for you. Did the Red Sox win? Oh, wow. <laughs> Dangerous to ask questions like that on the fly. Whew. OK, next year. Uh, I'll get you another seat. So uh, as we wrap up here, I, I do want to say one thing that's very personal to me. There was no workshop without you. And um, I hope in some small way that each of you takes away something that inspires you to help be an entrepreneur or help other entrepreneurs. Because what happens here is always a very simple thing. People make things happen. And the great entrepreneurs find what their passion is. They pursue it with the kind of conviction that it takes to make something really impactful in the world. And in my experience, no amount of sharing or learning or anything else makes any more difference than you finding out what that is. And so thank you for the opportunity to do it. Thank you for the people who inspired me, who came up time and time again and shared their thoughts, brought their own passion and conviction, also were very personal about it, and indeed brought a lot of fun. It was great fun. Thank you all very much. So while Jeffrey, you come up and get settled here, um, I want to say just one last thank you, because they often get forgotten in the scene, and I don't want them to be. The iLab made this all possible. So a big thank you to Jody, to Neil, and to Gordon for enabling this. Jeffrey really needs no introduction, but I just want to share it to you in a personal way. Uh, he, I think, is officially an author and an advisor, but he's actually, behind the scenes, an all-around great human being. He's uh, somebody who actually started as an English lit major, I believe. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Uh, and you can tell that in his writing. But he's one of those people who, when he got into, for example, Regis McKenna and worked with so many startups, realized there was a fundamental problem, why startups weren't making it to the promised land. Instead of just watching that, he did something about it. And I have greatest admiration for the fact that he not only did something about it, but he put it in a framework that has made the impact that it has on so many people. So Jeffrey, thank you. It's oh, a great pleasure. pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Um, <laughs> so I kind of feel like you've already gotten your money's worth. I mean, like, you know, maybe five minutes and we'll be done. Uh, what Michael was doing, and, and what's so important about, about the startup world, is frameworks really, really count. Because at the beginning, you have, that's all you got. There, there's no data, there's no history, there's no, there's no inertial momentum. There's only projections into the future. 
And using frameworks to create common vocabulary is the way you navigate in a startup. And what I want to do is share with you, and by the way, that's what makes people who love startups, they love that active mind. That active mind begins to be uh, selected against as organizations get larger and larger and larger. And that creates an, a new set of problems, which are kind of reflected in the title of this book that, that I've been working on. So for the first 10 years of my career, I worked in, almost entirely with startups, entirely around disruptive innovation. Got to know Clay Christensen, Innovator's Dilemma. That was what it was about. That was, we call it the 90s, particularly the late 90s, we call the time of the great happiness. Uh, it, was just, it was just great. And then the bubble popped. And when the bubble popped, one of the things that happened was the companies that were left standing were, were, were the, the established large enterprises. Good, you having fun? And, and we began, part. And we began, and we began working with them. And, and, and what I want to share with you is that, is that uh, the books that, that Michael was referring to, Crossing the Chasm Inside the Tornado, that was from, from the point of view of taking the first, your first enterprise kind of all the way through the life cycle. What was the, the later book's about, and what this book is about, is more about a new tech challenge. And, and the old tech challenge was sort of you know, leveraging disruptive innovations breaking into developed markets, navigating the life cycle, crossing the chasm. And a lot of it is emotional. I mean, I thought what was really cool about what Michael did for the last hour is it's your life, right? I mean, it's, it, it comes as much from here as it comes from any place else. Uh, and, and looking at the new challenge, it's a different situation. And it, it's, not, it's harder to have that personal energy. If you're in a company of 10,000 people, it's just, it's a very, very different beast, right? It's just, and, 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 but society needs these companies. It's not like we can say, well, you know, we'll just all be startups. It doesn't work, okay? The world wants to some things to scale, and, but if you're going to scale, and if the innovations that you're bringing to market as an entrepreneur are gonna have the biggest impact, they must scale, then we have to figure out a new set of issues. And I kinda of wanna share some of the learnings that have come out of that. So the, the challenge now is how do you leverage established enterprises, and how do they break out of, not break into, we were breaking and entering in the 90s. Now we're trying to actually break out, escape the kind of the inertial pull, the gravitational field of your past, right? And, and solve for this thing that Clay called the innovator's dilemma. He wrote that book in 1997. It's been 15 years. You, you might think we might have actually solved for it, right? Suppose you say, well, no, it's, it's, it's a problem. We'll just live with it. It's like, no, no. And so that's what escape velocity is, is kind of focused on. So just to give you a feeling of this, you know, I've been around, Michael's been around for 20 years, I've been around longer, but I just, this is a kind of a credit list of companies that did not escape. Many of whom were headquartered within probably 50 miles of where we're standing right now. And you look at that list of companies, and the drill here is, these were not bad companies, Th this, this was the best of the best. This was us, right? So you think, whoa, okay, so maybe I, maybe it's a little more serious than I thought. However, to be fair, when I would put up that list, a lot of people would say to me, Jeff, wrong century, dude. Come on, come on, come on. 21st century, come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. So what I want to do with you now, I'm going to share with you just six slides that are comparing 10-year histories in this century of major established companies to the NASDAQ, okay? So the, the, you, you may not be able to read it, but this is Microsoft, Intel, and SAP. The orange line in every case is the NASDAQ. And the other line, the blue line, is the company. Now, you can't, what you really can't see but must see, but just look at the orange number at the top. That tells you how high does this, this axis go. So this is 100% axis. So what this thing says is over the, over the first last 10 years, the NASDAQ's gone up about 60%. Microsoft's gone up about, looks like about maybe 4 to 8, maybe 9%. Intel's actually gone down a little bit. And SAP has tracked almost exactly to the NASDAQ, OK? So those, those are three kind of, okay, pretty close. And the next one was 150 thing. And again, you know, so uh, the NASDAQ's outperformed Cisco, uh, at least recently. IBM has outperformed the NASDAQ recently. Nokia took a, a kind of a header with, 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 the Ender, uh, uh, with the iPhone coming into the world. Uh, Adobe's kind of ha had a good run, but it's kind of come back, we call it regression to the mean or coming back to the norm. You look at the next ones, you say, okay, uh, this is HP, uh, the sort of the, the herd moments where they got, had quite good stock volatility, came right back. Oracle has kind of have a sustained, I think their whole consolidation pitch, I think people are saying, wow, that, that's real new added value. MC with EMC and, NAS, and NetApp with storage, I think the categories are helping them a lot. 
This is now 400% variability. Google, obviously, still kind of on their first run. W way to go. Uh, Autodesk I, I made, I think, a, a significant change in, in their world, getting more into, in, into design and, and the consumer world. eBay, big run, kind of came down. You've got to hand it to John. He's, he's sort of doing some good things there. Citrix, quite, quite an interesting company of uh, uh, recently. Uh, Yahoo, more trials, more tribulations, kind of tough. Uh, and Intuit, interestingly, maybe coming into a new world with, with this new SaaS uh, and, and, and SMB world. And then there are two other stocks. There's Amazon, and there's our friends at Apple. And the, the one at Apple, by the way, goes to 5,000%, okay? Now, you look at that and you think, okay, what, what's going on? I mean, what is, and I think the conventional wisdom here, and what, what I've heard all my life is, well, the winners outperform the losers, right? Or their peers. Well, if, if outperformed means the line went higher, yes. But what, is, what does outperform mean? And I don't believe this. I don't believe, I, I know the companies that, quote, did not outperform the NASDAQ. I gotta tell you, those are some of the most remarkable performance cultures you will ever see. So these, and there's a couple of exceptions of places, but in general, these companies performed unbelievably well for the last 10 years. I was very close to Cisco for the last 10 years, and, and, and very close to, to, to SAP. And there's, a, there's just really, really strong performance capabilities. My belief is that this is not about performance which is a little bit anathema since I'm on the board of directors and shareholders really believe in performance and I'm probably gonna get fired. But the deal here is that if the delta in stock price is not about performance, what is it about? I think it's about power. And what I mean by power is, I mean the, the reason I think changes in power affect changes in stock price is because investors care about your future performance. And they actually value a share of stock as a share of the future earnings of your company, not the past earnings. So what they wanna know is, do I think, if I buy your stock today, you will outperform your past going forward? When Microsoft is dead flat, that doesn't mean Microsoft isn't performing. It means Microsoft is not outperforming its own past, okay? It is captured in the gravitational field of its own past. And so I think the P in power is the P and PE ratio. And that when these companies change their stock prices, what happens is, it's not that they, they, they've changed their performance, it's that people see them having much more power. And so for example, if you think about Apple with this 5,000%, why do you believe, why is Apple worth 50 times more now than it was 10 years ago? Well, dude, the iPod, iTunes, iPhone, iPad, where you been, Jeff? Okay, so the point is they had three net new earnings engines added to a fourth one, which has become revitalized by the other three. So they've now got four massive earnings engines where 10 years ago, arguably they had none, or 15 years ago, when Steve came back in 97, arguably they had none, okay? So this issue around power, what, what I think this means to me is what I want to spend time with, uh, with larger companies, and this is a conversation that, that investors always have with small companies and startups. In a startup, there is only power. There is no performance in a startup, right? There's PowerPoints, but that's pretty much it, <laughs> right? right? So, 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 so if you invest in startups, you're only investing in power. That's the only thing that there is to invest in. Now, you want to translate that power into performance, but what's interesting about large established companies is that thing's gotten reversed. And it's gotten reversed to the point that, that people look at, at, at quarterly returns, which is, which is their version, which is, in fact, the, the classic metrics of performance are built around quarterly financial returns. And they start trying to play, they're trying to guide the future of their company and make management decisions based on quarterly returns, which are performance metrics. And I, I will tell you, if you don't perform, you need to pay attention to them. But, so it's not that they, are, that they are unnecessary, but they are insufficient. And in fact, I think what's happened is that the performance dialogue has become so articulate and the MBA curriculums have become so effective at managing performance, we're wildly out of balance. And what we need to say is, look, it's not that anything about performance is wrong, because it's a yin-yang. 
right? You create power in order to consume it through performance, in order to create returns to invest in more power. I mean, so, so it's, a, it's a yin and a yang, right? So, so but the game there has got to be, we got to talk more articulately about power. When we come to talk about power in large corporations, and I'm a strategy consultant, so that's kind of what we talk about, the conversation goes from like postgraduate to third grade. Okay? It just sucks. Okay? So the intent of this book and the intent of the work for the last five years is we need to have a more articulate conversation. So it's back to frameworks. And just like Michael will put up, I don't actually use quite as many uh, 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 acronyms or, or slipperies and flips and cubes and roams and you know, all that kind of cool stuff. I just five. But, but, but the frameworks are, are the key here. Because again, when you're talking about the future, you're talking about stuff. There is no data from the future. Okay? Just kind of a basic rule. So therefore, you have to have frameworks to project into the future. So this framework says, when you're talking about business power, you need to sub-segment that into five kinds of power. And that a lot of the conversations about strategy that are bad happen because the vice president of sales is thinking about, you know, about uh, market power. The engineering guy is thinking about offer power, the you know, company power, the, the CFO is thinking about company power, you know, some vice president of business development is thinking about category, and they're all talking past each other. So here's how it works. The first, and I, by the way, this is an order of importance, I think. The most determinative predictor of your future returns, I believe, is what category you're in. This is sort of like pretty much investor 101. You know, do you want to be invested? You, know, if you, you could be in, in, in printing, right? Or you could be in search. Or you could be in storage. You sort of think, or you could be in desktop PCs. It's like, OK, you, know, you could be the best house in a bad neighborhood. Or you could be kind of a mediocre house in a great neighborhood. And the first predictor of your, of your future for the next few years is going to be what category are you in. So if you're a large company, the challenge is, could we get into a new category? Could we? I mean, obviously, we're, because, because basically, we're getting credit for all the categories we're in already. Could we get into a new category? Because category moves a whole bunch of money into a new place. Could we do that? Could we do that? So that's, that's a pretty important question for companies to ask themselves every year. Many years, the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is yes, if. And, and of course, part of what we're going to talk about today is co large companies are spectacular at not being able to do this. They're like, just world class at not achieving this objective. Okay? And they spend a fortune against it. So it's a big deal. But what we got to do here is like, damn it, Clay told us that in 1997. We have to solve for this. We can't just, we can't just shake our heads and feel superior. Okay? Company power. Company power is. Are you the go-to company in your category? Do, people, do the partners in your ecosystem bring the business to you first? Then you've got company power. If they don't, you've got a challenge. Now you're swimming uphill all the time. You're trying to earn, earn, earn a thing. And that actually will get you into market power, which is OK. If I can't be the gorilla, if I'm playing a chimp game, I've got to have some place where they like chimps, my chimps. The fact that Apple was around to do the 5,000% was because it had a set of incredibly loyal customers that carried it through a very, very, very tough patch. So market, and, it's, and when you're small, and when you're crossing the chasm, and when you're an entrepreneur, the whole key there is, I need to find some market that will be, be a home where I can grow my company. And that the market itself will protect me. My customers will defend me against my competitors because they're that loyal to me. Why? Because I made such a deep commitment to a problem that was especially spe unique to them. That pain gain thing that Michael was talking about. I made a whole product commitment that nobody else is willing to make. I'm so little, it looked big to me, right? But all the big guys, it just looked like sand in their shoe, so they wouldn't do it. And then there's offer power, which is you know, the thing itself, the, the price, the performance, the 10x effect that Michael was talking about, that's offer power. And it's great, but you got to understand, offers are ephemeral. right? So offers come and go, but they are the, the only thing on this list that customers can buy, so they're pretty darn important, but you got to realize they're going to be moving. And then finally, execution power, and you think, well, Jeff, I thought, per isn't performance and execution the same thing? For most of the time, it is. The place where I don't think it is is in this thing here, which I'm going to talk to you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about execution in terms of anything that is a strategic initiative which requires you to cross a tipping point. It's a subset of execution problems. The claim I'm making is that for most classes of execution problems, large corporations are extremely good at doing them, particularly if they've done them before. But in the class of problems where you have to actually 
change state and pass a tipping point, large corporations are very bad at it, and that's, that's a huge, huge problem for them. So, th so the whole book, just th this book here, this red book, it's organized around those five, there's a chapter on each of the five powers, and sort of how would you play it, and it's told from the point of view of a larger company, of, of, of a large company who's trying to do this. I, there's two reasons for the entrepreneurs in this room to maybe still say, well, why would I even open this thing? The, the first is, you might get acquired by one of these guys, okay? And then you'll learn about a phrase called an earnout, okay? <laughs> so there it will be a period. And further, when you marry off your only child to someone, you, you actually care about the future of that child. So, you're, you're, so if your company goes and gets acquired by a larger company, you're going to care. You're going to care. And, 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 so hopefully there's some things to, to play there. And also the second thing is, particularly in this next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the learning around execution power, and I'm going to close with a little bit of learning around the category power. I'm not going to, do, not going to try to do the ones in the middle. But, but the ones at the beginning, this execution power, there's something in here which I think will be fun for those of you who are not B2B, but who are in fact either B2C or B2B2C. One of the things we learned about crossing the chasm, as Michael uh, championed it, it is a B2B book. It's a B2B book about B2B problems. The last 10 years has been a whole lot of B2C stuff going on. Crossing the chasm is nowhere near as important as inside the tornado, and the way you play the tornado is very different. So I'm going to actually show you a companion model to the crossing the chasm model for B2C stuff, which I think will be kind of interesting. And, but I want to make the point in this context, it's about cross, in both cases, it's about getting past the tipping point. The tipping point that an entrepreneur has to get back for, past is, at the margin, do I have a persistent company? What an accountant will call a going concern. And until you've crossed the chasm, you do not. Meaning, if you withdraw your personal energy, your company will go away. If you don't get the next round of funding, your company will go away. There's a point at which you cross a tipping point, and if you go away and the funding goes away, the company still persists. It has enough of a flywheel of market reality, customer commitment, partner commitment, working capital, et cetera, et cetera. It is a going concern. That's the fundamental tipping point that entrepreneurs worry about. The, entre the tipping point that established companies have to worry about is, is it possible for us to onboard a net new earnings engine in this enterprise or not? And if you can't, then you cannot, then, then using stock performance is going to be a very, very, very unhappy compensation uh, 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 mechanism for you for decades to come, as it has been at Microsoft, as it has been at Cisco, as it has been at SAP. Because it's, damn it, the stock doesn't move. And what does it take to move the stock? And the claim is it takes a net new earnings engine to move the stock. Okay, that's the idea. And so that is a kind of an entrepreneurial idea as well. Okay, so the execution thing. So this is transitioning to scale, growth born from reaching tipping points. Both think about this both as an entrepreneur who's at Northbridge or MDV or some other incredibly high class VC firm. I don't know if there are any others, but there's like those two. I'm a venture partner at Moore Davidow. Uh, where we funded Michael at, at that time. Anyway, um, execution power. So you might be there or you might be, you, you've just been bought by IBM, Cisco, Microsoft, Google, whomever. So the arc of execution, where in the execution life cycle are you? So when you look at execution, you have this thing, okay, we're inventing it, and at some point we are going to deploy this thing at scale, and eventually if it's out in the world long enough, we're actually gonna worry about how to optimize this thing. And the scalability is, is, is the key thing that I'm going to be focused on. There's a subsequent transition around profitability. The consulting ideas about deploying and optimizing are about 30 to 45 years old. They're extremely good. They're based on using data dramatically. They're not based on very much on frameworks. But the stuff on scaling has to be still based on frameworks because, again, you're inventing the future. So in this model, oh, that didn't work very well. Okay, so in this model, uh, there's a tipping point. And the claim about this tipping point is prior to the tipping point, every day it is harder. You wake up and it's actually a harder day than the previous day. It's a little bit like bicycling. You know, if you start bicycling and you go over a hill, you're kind of going initially on the flat. Your bike, you're starting up, you know, you got your bike going, okay, it's going, it's going pretty good, pretty good. And then you start up the hill and you're still pedaling pretty good. And then there's, it's like, uh, okay, there's some point in here, in my case, sooner than your case, but, 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 but you're at this point, and until you're going to get to the top of the hill, every next 10 yards, you're actually performing 
worse than you did the prior 10 yards. Okay? So, so if, 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 if I'm using performance metrics, your performance is degrading systematically as you go forward. And sooner or later, if I'm, using, if I'm looking at you through a performance lens, I'm going to say, Jeff, you're not much of a bicyclist, are you? Huh, dude, dude. You should like maybe drive or walk. You know, get off the bike. We're not going to fund the bike any longer. Okay? <laughs> That's what happens to strategic initiatives. Okay? In other words, they get to that point, and, 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 and the, so the key concept here, and it's a real challenge, is to say to people, until you've reached the tipping point, no performance metric matters unless it's related to getting to the tipping point, past the tipping point. So return on invested capital, return on equity, uh, you know, operating ratios, cost to, cost to traffic, revenue, every conceivable operating metric that the corporation runs all of its annual planning, all of its investor relations around. Not, it's not that they're irrelevant, they're toxic. They're toxic. That's why there is a venture industry, because venture, you know, venture, and what venture does, though, to be fair to it, it just takes it completely out of that environment and says, well, we're just going to play in an environment. We've raised capital with the understanding that operating metrics aren't important until after the tipping point. That's the fundamental contract with the limited partner. That is not a contract you have in a large corporation. It is not the contract with a public shareholder. So understand, if you're running a large corporation, you've got a real challenge. And by the way, we can say, well, that's their problem, not our problem, except we live in a society that needs jobs. And large corporations have a lot of jobs. Okay, okay. so why tipping points? This, uh, 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 Michael was talking about this, but this notion that adoption is social. People do what they see other people doing. That's what creates a tipping point. So I'm, junior high dance problem, right? Boys on one side of gym, girls on the other side of a gym, right? Adoption is social, right? I'm not going, you go out there, I'm not going out there, right? And, and then at some other point, it's like everybody's out there, and oh my God, I gotta get out there, right? Uh, it was very harder, by the way, in my day, because in my day, a boy and a girl had to dance in pairs, right? It's a little easier now, you just, you just get out there, go out, dance like around like this, you'll, you'll, you'll look good, you'll look good, okay. <laughs> It leads to two mirror image phenomena, which is the chasm, which is I'm not going out there, and the tornado, which is oh, I'm, not staying, I'm not staying back, right? But both cases, it's peer pressure, right? It's peer pressure in both ways. Uh, Pre-tipping point, no progress is sustainable. <coughs> and post-tipping point, there's no going back. I mean, the, the tipping point is fundamental to, to this game. <coughs> and any strategic initiative has a tipping point idea behind it. So, so managing to the tipping point became a really powerful notion. And I kept on challenging managers. I'd say, you know, do you guys manage to the tipping point? Do you even have any metrics about where you think the tipping point is? Do you have any, do you have any, how do you know? How will you know? Finally, one CEO said, Jeffrey, stop. Tipping points are really easy to see in retrospect. Right? How do you see them looking the other way? Good question. Let me get back to you on that, right? It's like, okay, how do you? And, and the issue is, you, you, so you have to start using frameworks and you have to start making guesses. And you may just arbitrarily invent it. And we say, you know what? We believe that 250 customers will have passed the tipping point. You don't know that. You have, you, 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 your, your gut tells you something. You say, and in addition to that, if 80, if 18% of those customers cross-reference to another customer, or you know, if I see you know a, 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 a return to my site of you know more than 30% of the customers come back more than once a week and they would stay there more than six minutes, who the hell knows what it is, right? But you have to have something to say. Let us drive to that place and see if we got to the tipping point. And, 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 and then kind of plan, kind of plan it forward. So the tipping point in the B2B world, this is the one that, that Michael and I spent all the time with in the nice. It is a great B2B model. It is not a B2C model. But it just said, look, in this social adoption of things, there got people that go really early, the innovators, then the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, the laggards. The key thing that the crossing the chasm was about was, guys, the first two groups secede from the bell curve and create something we call the early market. And that also, however, the pragmatists will not. The pragmatists are hanging back now. And that created the chasm. And the whole idea behind this was if you could find a subset of pragmatists, a very focused segment. Remember when Mark, Michael took you through all those circles and we got down to field service personnel, the medical equipment in critical care conditions, right, right there. Find, we called them pragmatists in pain 
because pragmatists in pain are more likely to convert before pragmatists in general. But eventually, you do get the killer app for pragmatists in general. That's what creates the tornado. That is no longer a niche market phenomenon. That's now a mass market phenomenon, or at least a horizontal phenomenon. And, and then you get to Main Street. And the key lesson of this model was, when you start an innovation, you have to do it twice. The first one flames out. So when you think you've lit the fire, you've lit the pre-fire. It's an important fire to light. That's what Steve Blank was trying to tell us with Four Steps to Epiphany. It's what Eric Reese is trying to tell us with Pivot. They're actually doing pre-chasm entrepreneurship. There's a lot of work you got to do to get to the chasm. Okay? But the point of this model is you got to light the fire twice. And the way you light the fire the second time is totally different from the way you lit it the first time. So first time, you, you, you light the fire on optimism. Second time, you light the fire on pessimism. The marketing of the first one is, look at all the wonderful things this technology can do. The marketing of the second one is, look how deep the soup is that you're standing in, okay? And I can get you out. But totally different, totally different game. That's why the whole product became so important to the second one. I can get you out of that quicksand. I have rope, I have, I have a place to tie it, I have a winch, I got the whole thing, right? That, that, that was the promise, okay. In that world, we developed a whole set of metrics. This is the set of metrics. It's been, it's been around for a long time. But at every stage, it would say to you, are we here? And if we've done these things, are we going to move on to the, next, to the next move? And the B2B world has had a chance to play with that for a while. The problem with these metrics is, it started happening about four or five years ago. I'd start getting these kind of nice, sort of deflecting comments from students saying, you know that Crossing the Chasm, that, that was a great book. Did you say was? Yeah, yeah, was. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, no, really, the, really, Jeff, it was, it was a great book, right? Oh, oh thank you. Okay. <laughs> so so I, they said, well, well, Jeff, I mean, Google, Facebook, YouTube, I mean, Instagram. Where, where was the chasm in Instagram? He got a billion dollars. What, what, what effing chasm is what, usually, what they're usually saying at this point. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? You are so clueless. It's embarrassing. Okay. So, and you know, it's, that's not bad. If you hang out in a venture firm, you at least try to look clue. I mean, cl you have a clue. You don't have to actually have a clue, but you have to look like you have a clue. And you can't stand on stage being clueless because it makes your partners embarrassed. So we said, okay, we got to come up with a different way to think about this. And so spent some time with people who were doing these kinds of projects. So what, what do you do? How, how do you? how do you make these things work? And we came up with this concept that the entrepreneur is like a, like a starter motor. And you're, you're trying to start one of these things. It, 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 we're trying to start a tornado. What we realized is that it wasn't a chasm problem, it was a tornado problem. And you say, well, how do you start a tornado? Kind of, in the, in, particularly on the web. And so they said, well, you got to acquire traffic somehow. So part of the thing is I'm going to run some experiments to figure out how can I acquire traffic, hopefully at low cost, hope, maybe at no cost. Then I have to come up with some way to engage. I've got to engage this traffic in a way that, that, that causes them to participate and value me. Then at some point, I've got to figure out how to monetize this. Now, in a lot of these models, monetization comes very late in the game, but you have to figure it out eventually. And then I need to, have to figure out how to enlist people to help me acquire the next traffic. So, so whether that's an upsell of myself personally or whether I'm referring a friend, you cannot, you, you have to have, the community has to help you enlist uh, to, to get the next, the next round of acquisitions. So think about Zynga, and, you know, how, getting your friends to play Farmville with you, that kind of an enlistment idea, right? So engagement is you participating, but enlistment is when you actually get other people to come pl uh, play in the community as well. So you think about, a, uh, about how this works, um, the, 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 uh, the guy in the middle, the starter motor, what he's doing is he's running these experiments. So he or she, the acquisition, engagement, you know, monetization, enlistment, we're just, we're just we're kind of, how would this work? You know? And then if the enlistment could get some more acquisition, okay, well, could that get some more engagement? Well, could that get some, uh, you know, uh, can, you know can we, and could we get a tornado? <laughs> and the answer is, Maybe, <laughs> maybe, not, not so often, but this apparently is state of the art. <laughs> you know, and by the way, prior to most of this, you were in a dorm room and your parents were paying for the dorm room anyway, so what, what the hell, right? I mean, you know, it didn't cost that much. Um, but, but that's kind of what was going on. So when we looked at this, we started to de decode it and say, okay, so what's going on and why does it matter? And we realized that two of these gears were performance gears. Now, they was, those are the gears that people were measuring 
on ComScore. They were measuring them on you know, any way they could. And the monetization gear. And these are the two gears that anybody who had investment in the company, you know, it was a, well, how much traffic are you getting? Well, how much are they spending on you? you give, me all, give me all your operating metrics. We called them the performance gears. And then we looked at the other two gears and we said, you know what? They're the power gears. They're the power gears. And they're actually the gears that are going to determine the future performance. So how engaged are people in this operation, the consumer, and how enlisted are they? And enlisted, by the way, is a really interesting, very simple enlistment metric called the net promoter score. You know that, that thing, NPS? Where, where they, the, question, the fundamental question they ask you is, how likely, 1 to 10, are you to refer this offer to a friend? It turns out if, if a person says 9 or 10, that means you have a, viral, a positive virality. If they say 7 to 8, you have a neutral virality. And if you have less than 6 or less, you actually have churn. You have a negative, a, a negative virality. Okay? So we're looking at that and say, OK, so gosh, so, so, so that led to a pretty interesting idea. So here are the four things you want to measure. And you do want them. And by the way, the person who said measure and then measure underneath and then measure underneath, these are the four places you want to start and then you want to go into. How, what is your rate of gaining new traffic or new users if it's a retail game, new customers, whatever it is? What, what is their kind of engagement, whether that's length, depth, frequency of user engagement? And obviously, in different situations, those are different things. How well is this thing monetizing? One of the knocks on Zynga is like 3% of their traffic monetize. 97% of their traffic does not monetize. So you think, well, that seems a little bit concerning. Uh, and, then, and then enlistment, who helps? And by the way, if you look at different properties right now, you say, well, let's look at LinkedIn. LinkedIn, acquisition, off the, top, off the charts. Uh, enlistment, you bet. People tell you to get on LinkedIn. Okay? Monetization, the recruiters alone can monetize the hell out of that thing, right? Engagement, that's their concern. We don't spend enough time on LinkedIn, right? That's, their worry. So that's where they're worried. Facebook. You've heard of Facebook, perhaps. OK, so Facebook, what's their issue? Well, I bet a billion, 100 billion, what could, could they have an issue? Yes, they can have an issue. Acquisition, 900 million. I think they got that one pretty good. OK, no, 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 I don't think it's a big problem. Engagement, you've got to be kidding me. People live on Facebook, OK? Not a problem. Enlistment, if you're, not in, if you're in the family and you're not on Facebook, your relatives will tell you, get on Facebook. Okay? Monetization, interesting. Desktop. Not so bad. Mobile, a disaster waiting to happen. Okay? The mobile monetization mechanism for Facebook does not exist in any reason, in anything that would correspond to the valuation that is going to be hit this week. It just doesn't. Now, could it? Yes. Does everybody want it to? Yes. Is it just Facebook's problem? Hell no. Everybody has this issue of how are we going to because. 50% of Facebook's traffic is on mobile devices. 50%. So the point about this thing is, in different situations, you, you will have different metrics matter. You should use this as an analytical filter to look at your B2C, or even your B to B to C, where you're the first B helping the second B. Look over that second B's shoulders and look at their C situation and figure out which of these four metrics is the one that they've got to fix, hopefully with your help. And so we have this concept called the slowest gear theory. Uh, just says, look, the thesis is prior to the tornado, at any given point in time, one of these gears is probably going to be slower than the other three. And so the actions that we are suggesting here are identify the slowest gear, focus everyone on speeding that one up, but don't take your eye completely off the other three gears. I mean, you can't just like be a serial. <laughs> this is where serial entrepreneur doesn't work. You have to keep all four gears spinning, right? When, Repeat every quarter until the tornado happens or you run out of gas. Okay? And that's sort of, that's sort of the, the new model. So I'm going to stop there for a second and just, I'd love to get your, so maybe your crap detector went off or, 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 or you know, how would you react to this model or what, what do you see in this model? A comment or a question? I'd love to just get a little bit of feedback. Yeah. Are you saying that this, like your other framework, is just a B2B model or it should, it doesn't strike me that there's a, I think it I think it is the, the distinction is this is I think a B2C model in the sense that it, it involves large number of people largely acting on their own. Whereas B2B models, you remember when Michael showed that huge set of constituencies that you all have to get aligned in order to 
get a sale. So that, that's the kind of inertial resistance where, where the B2B model works better. But in this one, I mean, and, and in a sense, you know, a tornado is a tornado in, in both ones. But I think this one's more about you don't have to get that kind of institutional buy-in, but you've got to get critical mass, whatever that, whatever that means. So that's the only reason I would call it. It might be B to E if it, in an employee. It could, it could be that. Okay. Uh, if you have an order of magnitude improvement on the present state of the art, as Mike was speaking earlier, is it possible to jump over the early adopters and go directly to a mainline, you're solving their core problem, and get those straight to the Yeah, but it's interesting, you know, going, uh, the, 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 the uh, Yes, the question is how discontinuous is your innovation? If you just make gasoline that, that is twice as effective and sells for half as much money, there's no adoption life cycle. Just put up the station, dude. Uh, so, so the issue then is, is how disruptive is it or who has to change their way, form of behavior? If the consumer doesn't have to change, that gives you enormous leverage against whoever does have to change to make them change. Look at what Apple did when they essentially gave iTunes to their folks. They could then make the entire music industry, which did not want to change, change because they had this incredible power. And they got that power because from the user's point of view, there was no technology adoption. Just go to iTunes and get your songs. I mean, you paid for them. That was strange, by the way, because remember, we had NetApp. I'm not, uh, we had Napster. Yeah, Napster. So yeah, look, there was 99 cents. But, but it was, it was, they, there was a de minimis enough change. So I think, I think in the B2C model, it's not about chasms and bowling pins. I really do think it's about going straight to the tornado, just straight to the tornado. Um, whereas I think in B2B, it is about chasms and bowling pins, because there's enough inertial resistance to anything new that you've got to overcome it. I think B2B is more predictable. I think B2Cs, when they win, are more lucrative. But B2Cs are still, to me, somewhat mystical. I think the, the, the gears, I think, help. But I think, you know, you're still trying to figure out what does it take to get a date? You know, I spent my entire adolescence trying to answer that question. <laughs> and I broke it down into frameworks, and it didn't help. OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With this model, what you would say about sustainability, you know, a lot of the opportunities you're talking about are ones which, you know, one person does, another person do it very quickly, and you've got to do it right and build a market or build a critical. I think, I think there's something inherently unsustainable. I think this is a fad business to a large degree. I, look at the movie business, look at the music business, look at, look at all the great consumer businesses. Uh, this, uh, th there are some that have sustained, McDonald's is a sustained consumer franchise. Um, but, but boy, there are an awful lot that, 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 that you know, don't, don't, don't get there. So it's, it's, a, it's a different game now. And you try to institutionalize it, like they made movie studios, we'll have DreamWorks, you know, DreamWorks will always create hit movies. Not so much, you know, and so uh, John Carter, yeah, okay. Uh, that wasn't DreamWorks, that was Disney, I know. Uh, but, uh, but that would be the other half of that. There's a question in the back, or a comment in the back. That was basically my question, but, you know, kind of building on that. So it's, it seems to me, you know, kind of thinking, I'm not, I don't know a lot about B2C, but, you know, just basically between B2B and B2C, I mean, for B2C, it just seems like a lot of people who are just kind of spending disposable income, and it's kind of, think of it like, Kind of like you sell the stupid people, you know, like like Zynga is basically selling people like a big time sink and stuff yeah. like that. Is that kind of, you know, good thing? Is that kind of yeah. what our entrepreneurial yeah. energy yeah. yeah. should be? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think if you were talking about, uh, let me make it put more honor into this system. All of human culture is going online and is being consumed through digital devices, and I mean all of human culture. I mean. Education, I mean healthcare, I mean war, and I mean love, and, and, and I mean literature, and I mean film, and I mean music, and I mean art, and I mean sports, and I mean news, and I mean being a citizen, and I mean being a criminal, right? It's all online, and, and it's becoming more online. So I think, I think there's a, I think Zynga is a good example of wasting time online, and I think all of us waste a certain amount of time online because we're usually standing in line at Starbucks, and so therefore wasting time, why not waste, you know, in a more interesting way. <laughs> but, 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 and I think, and by, by the way, and, and the economics isn't that I'm buying stupid stuff as often as I'm being advertised to. One of the scary things about this is the way that model was monetized was is media advertising, right? Brand advertising, media advertising. And the problem was we haven't cracked the code on these small 
I think on an iPad you're fine, but on anything smaller, that's the spooky thing. Yeah. Um, I think what you say repeat every quarter is way too soft. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm old, so just bear with me. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I, th I think it probably is too slow. I, I think in a large company, it's probably not too slow uh, because that actually is light speed in, in some large companies, but you're right. So what do you think is a better, is a more likely cadence? Weekly? Repeat every week? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I, I'm with you. I, I think I, I, actually, I buy that, I think. I would do it weekly until, if, if, if maybe after a while you'd say, that maybe even weekly is too little, but I, I don't think it is. But maybe you'd go, I think that's a, that's a good fix, yes. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. And I want to ask you, according to your framework, for example, in the case of LinkedIn, when they went into Japan, they tried the same formula, and they have half a million users in a country with a hundred and million <coughs> population. So do you apply this framework in each single market again? You have every to. single new market is a new revenue stream by the end of the day. So. I, and I think it may be a different gear. It may be a different gear. So for example, in Japan, I'll bet you that the enlistment gear runs at the speed of a glacier. But just think about Japanese culture. You're going to reach out to another business person in Japan and tell them to join LinkedIn? Not in any of the meetings I was in in Japan. So, so I do. Th so, I, so I think I think there are so I think you're right. You have to solve for different dynamics in different places. Maybe if they could get the engagement gear to go faster in Japan, that would give them some help. But if they try to work directly on the enlistment gear directly, well, maybe they. I'm, I don't know. But you're right. But but so they have an, they have an engagement gear problem in the U.S. They, I would argue they have an enlistment one in Japan. Yeah. Is, is there a bit of a timing issue in that? It seems like you got to get enough of the funnel cloud going before you focus on the other ones. If you're Facebook and you focus on the monetization really hard, really early. Doesn't work. You know, yeah. I would argue for media models in general, and I would say that Facebook is a media property, um, you, don't, you actually monetize, monetize very, very late. We used to have a thing in the, in, in the 90s which was called URL, stood for ubiquity now, revenue later. And, and, and that, that is the media model, I think. So you would, that would be an example where you just set monetization aside. Google didn't, mon remember, Google had gone public, really, before it really had a, a clear monetization model. And, 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 and so, yeah, yeah. How do you see this model playing into this trend towards the sort of consumerization of enterprise? You, know, you look at Apple and Google as kind of examples of that, where consumers let first enterprise adopt later, but, and Facebook's kind of scary in that. Who knows if right. it's an enterprise No, this is, a, this is important. It relates a little bit to the question that came out of here. So I, I'm sort of dining out on a speech I'm giving these days about enterprise IT, which says, from systems of record to systems of engagement. So I, I think of these consumerization things as systems of engagement. And I think of the old database Oracle stuff as systems of record. So two things have to happen. This model would work for the employee side of adoption. So, and, and in general, what, what people are doing, because sometimes people say, well, it's just like Facebook. And it's this dweeby thing that HR came out with that just sucks, right? So it's not just like, okay, so, so there's still a kind of a engagement problem you gotta get there. Yeah, come to our corporate website and learn about all the exciting things HR wants you to learn about. Even in Starbucks, I wouldn't do that, right? <laughs> so, so, okay, so, but then the other half of it, if it's a, so now what is happening in IT is bring your own device, so people are saying, you know, bring any, bring Mac, PC, Android, iPod, whatever the hell, iPad, whatever it is. So that, okay, so now I've got the B, the B, the E is already in. There, but now the, the CIO is going, hang on, I have a boatload of very, very, very tough problems to solve. And I, and I have a re restricted talent base, and by the way, it's not fit for this purpose. So that's where the chasm problem is happening. So I would argue Jive, Chatter, uh, Yammer, uh, all that stuff, I don't think it's crossed the chasm. I, I, I think it's still on the early side of the chasm because the problem is the IT guys are still trying to balkanize it, bucket it, you know, keep it at some distance because there's some very, very real liability security issues. And, and, and I know sometimes they use security as a head fake, but in this case it, it probably is real. Yeah. I hate the idea of poking a hole in the framework because I actually no, you know, go, it helps to plug well, a hole. The yeah. examples you bring, it seems like they didn't focus on increasing the speed of their slowest gears. They instead looked at what gears were spinning the fastest 
and it helped make those spin even faster and capitalize on those. And eventually, that compensated for whatever. Was wow! So that might, okay, that should be that should be an alternative game plan. Let's call that game plan B, which is screw the brakes. Let's just hit the accelerator, right? Or, you know, <laughs> no, but 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 but, but kind of, you know, you know, kind of. So, so so this guy he, got, he thinks we have to run on four wheels. No, we can. We're a unicycle. <laughs> okay, you know. I feel, it feels like there's some truth in that. It really does. So, so no, man, just spin the hell out of one of those gears and see if they can't like, drag the other ones around with them. I think, that's a, I think it's a, a totally viable hypothesis, and I think it ought to be called like hypo action hypothesis number two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just yeah. a couple quick thoughts. One is uh, I, I, I think that putting monetization before enlistment, I just feel like enlistment comes way, way earlier, like right after acquisition in the way these things tend to work when they're successful. I think the other thing is that um, it, it, engagement is a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a tricky thing because like you use the Zynga example and I think people are very engaged in those games. Yes. They're, they're in them all the time. And then you take Google, which is obviously a much more effective monetization effort. And I think, you know, the Google folks will say, our goal is to get people <coughs> off the page, off the SERP page as fast as possible. Right. Um, and so it's almost, I mean, I think there's another concept that is maybe yes. fits under engagement, which yeah. has to do with delight, yeah. which has to do with like how it triggers pleasure. Yeah. And Google triggers pleasure. By getting you out of here, get, get in, get out, and get, get on with your life. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that, I think that's true. The other one, by the way, the reason monetization is where it is, not, well, part of it was because I couldn't redraw the diagram, let's be clear. Uh, but <laughs> but, but uh, power, no expense was spared on this presentation because none was incurred. I, I just, I, uh, but, but, um, but in a retail model, in a retail model, it's where it belongs. And actually, the last time I gave this talk was to an online e-commerce situation where you had to monetize early on. And so you had to put it in there. But I, I agree with Adam. I think in the media game, it's totally correct. The, the, the monetization gear comes forth and often comes very late in the game and lightly. And you kind of like, it's almost like a clutch. It's almost like a not, you know, in it, don't, don't slow it down too much, you know, kind of. I think just, sorry, just yeah. one more thing. You're yeah. comparing the B2B and the B2C models. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of startups have gotten obsessed with what I think is a B2B model, which is this idea of minimally viable product. Yeah. I don't think it works in B2C. I mean, I think viable sounds like you're still in the ICU, and nobody wants to hang out with people in the ICU. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. No, this is like, this is like Valentine's Day, minimally viable bouquet. Probably not, probably not the romance winner, you know? If she sees the cellophane around it, you know, and like Kroger's in the, I gave her flowers on Valentine's Day, for God's sake, what does she expect, right? Eh, well, more than that, more than that. Okay, yeah, so, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Delighting, Deli so that's a delighter issue, yeah, you bet. So, yeah, well, I want to push back a little bit on the idea of the time frame, how long is it you iterate again, and I think a lot of the rhetoric now in the, like, lean startup methodology is that it's, when you're testing hypotheses, you're, you're really, your role is as, as a scientist. So it's really a question of statistical significance. Yes. Where if you have a large user funnel and you can get a lot of data and feedback, there's no reason why you can't iterate you know, five times in the same day, if you actually have a large pipe going in to test right. certain hypotheses, and you can do these things in parallel. So there's no reason why you can't run right. five tests at the same time. Right. And pick the best one. I, I think, I, so fair enough. So if you, if you can do design of experiments, and actually are smart enough to, to be able to do multivariate kind of regression analysis, yes. And I think the point that's coming out here that we all should absorb is, Jeff, it isn't a specific cycle of time. It's how fast can we close the loop in, in, in a reasonably, and expect to learn something and, the, and, the, and then move on. And also, obviously, on the web, speed, the faster, this is such a fast medium that the faster you can do it, the better you can do it without burning out your company. Okay, yeah. I think one thing that might be subtly missing, but I'm not sure if it's a missing gear just sort of yeah. behind the scenes, is the uh, importance of adoption, support, innovation from other business partners. I think part of the reason why monetization comes so late in media is that the advertisers, the advertising agencies, don't have a clue at first how to use it. Right? So it takes a while for them to figure out what the ad unit is, right. what the interaction right. is. And with, with iTunes, you, know, you can have iTunes, but until you, until you bring the music industry right. up. Right, you had to bring the backlist. Yeah. Yeah, I, can, I think that's fair. I think, I think you should be always looking for kind of like the inherent inertial resistance to the new phenomenon. Uh, and and, and in, in some cases, like with, with, with Zynga, I think they actually were able to spin up 
pretty quickly because they use virtual goods as their own thing. But and, that's, and their partner was Facebook. And their partner was Facebook, fair enough. And, 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 they, and they got that kind of going there. Okay. Okay, well, that was, that, so that was some of the stuff I wanted to share. I just want to close with one thing. I'm going to take it to another place, and then if we have some time for talking about it, or maybe we'll talk about it over lunch. But, but this is the one that has to do, this is when I'm spending time in boardrooms with CEOs and executive teams, making myself pretty thoroughly unpopular. And, and here's kind of, so it says, look, guys, we, this is this category power idea. You know, we've talked a lot about the venture world where they are. This is the, the great place for a, a, a big company is to be in the B section of this thing. No adoption problems, you just scale it. The C is where you have to actually worry about optimizing margins. You know, the D is where you start worrying about, oh my God, if I stay too long in this category, I will have a Kodak moment. And the, that's, the, <laughs> that's the Kodak moment at the end, okay? Kind of thing. Well, but, but you know, that w I would argue that Kodak was one of the five best brands in the world for most of my life, at least in the top 10. So, so it, I mean, this is brutal, right? Uh, so you acquire power, you utilize power, you invest power. And then, and then the idea, what, 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 what you're trying to do when you reinvent yourself, you're not trying to recross the chasm because frankly that, that's too small. You've got to have something that's big enough to scale pretty quickly. What you'd really like to do is kind of get into a new category kind of on the, on the right side of the chasm, ideally like right about there and, to, and then kind of scale that up, going, going up. That's what you'd like to have happen. Because what you're looking for is you want growth, but you, and, and that's what, that, and by the way, that means you need to acquire or develop power. But the issue is at some size, if you're a $10 billion company or a 20 or 30 or $40 billion company, just fig, it's the law of large numbers. You can't really change your stock price until you have a new earnings engine that's earning several billion dollars. So you're a hundred million dollars, like you're a rounding error, right? So it's a real problem if you think about that. And, and that's where the performance metrics, so you have this real challenge, you have to have power and performance in order to have this thing move the needle in a large company. And, and so when you look at these A, B, C, Ds, they kind of go like that. Basically, you know, the, the, the early thing, it's high growth, but it's not material revenues. You're gonna try to get into the B section of that curve, which is gonna give you both high growth and material revenues. Eventually, you'll get into the C section. It'll become yet another earnings engine. It will be the 8086 architecture at Intel, or it will be Windows, or it will be Office at Microsoft, or it will be you know, the ERP suite at SAP, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, and then the final one would be, would be D, which is it, it, it's, it's heading toward E. Right? Okay. So here's what you see in, in the world of uh, large companies. This is a typical portfolio pattern in virtually all companies that have those stock prices which are close to the NASDAQ. They have big franchises, but they're not growing very fast. If you spend time in them, it's not visible in, outside the company, but inside the company, they have way cool, neat stuff, but it's not material in terms of the size of the revenue, and they've got some aging stuff, right? And the first question the board always asks is, why don't we have more business in Quadrant 2? You know, did, did, you have, did, did you guys see Quadrant 2? How about Quadrant 2, right? And, and so you look at this problem, and the, this, is, this is how it happens. So it turns out the key to understanding a large corporation is to understand that there are three different investment horizons that interact with each other in a large corporation that cause the dynamic called the innovator's dilemma. The first horizon is if I spend money on this, I will make it back this year. I'll hire more salespeople, my revenue will go up. Okay? It's a horizon one, it's all about operating expenses, it's all about getting things done. You know what, large corporations are world class at this stuff. Just really, really, really good. What we always say about large corporations is, you know what, they can't innovate for, sh for some soup. Right, <laughs> uh, yeah, but anyway, you know what, not true. Totally untrue. The labs in large corporations have way cool stuff. Venture would kill to get that stuff and often does, okay? Um, so, so, I mean, really, I mean, think about Xerox Park. It just, like, Silicon Valley dined off of Xerox Park for like two decades. It was really, really cool stuff. The problem was when they try to bring it from Horizon 3, which is, I'm gonna get a return on this investment, but not anytime soon. And by the way, it comes out of a CapEx budget more than the OpEx budget. It's kind of like the corporate tax that we spend on the future. But when you try to get through Horizon 2, which is a interesting horizon. Horizon 2 says, we're gonna spend money out of our working capital budget this year, and we're actually not gonna get anything for it this year. We'll get something for it next year, and something really pretty exciting for it the following year. And 
Thank you for playing. Okay. So what, what's going on here? Because th th this, is, this is absolutely fatal to innovation. So what's going on here, Horizon 3 coming in, Horizon 2 is the one where I'm trying to get from Horizon 3 to Horizon 1. Horizon 1 is the, the, all the, where all the material revenues are created. Horizon 0, if you want to worry about it, is kind of where we're getting in danger of running off the thing. So performance management is all about Horizon 1. We're really good at Horizon 1, not a problem. Horizon 1 managers, how do you do that? How do you make your numbers quarter after quarter after quarter? You cheat, you lie, and you steal. And then you try not to lie too much. But you steal all the time. You hoard resources because you can't get it done any other way. There's too much variability in the world. So all of a sudden, H2 comes, and the thing that makes H2 different from H3 is H2 wants the same resources that H1 uses. And in particular, they want the same sales resources, the same go-to-market resources, marketing resources, professional service. It's all the customer-facing stuff that really is, is in jeopardy here. And, 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 and so it, uh, the, the H1 managers go, ah! And, you know, and they, by the way, they also cling, they cling to the other business. They need more money. But, and Horizon 3 is not affected. So the Horizon 2 challenge is, it, just, it works like this. H1, during the annual planning process, gets first dibs at all the resources. By the time H2 gets to the table, there are no A players left. Right? There are probably a few lingering Bs. Right? I mean, just because they grabbed them all. Right? They, and, so, and so H3, by the way, gets stars, but they're not stars that H1 wants. I mean, they're weird people. Right? But, but, but they're wonderfully weird. But they're not useful in H1. They're useful as corporate entertainment. Right? Bring your customer to corporate. Show them, like, Larry, with whatever that weird thing Larry's doing. <laughs> And then sell them some more storage servers, right? You know, come on. Okay? So it's, it's a great relationship, right? But H2 is like no dice. H2 is now an entrepreneurial business unit trying to get a piece of my sales force, a piece of my marketing budget. A, it, it's like, and a, no, no. So, so, and, and the problem is, in that model, the H1 guy says, well, I can support as many H2 initiatives as you want. I don't, if you don't want me to make my number. I mean, it's blackmail. It's pure and utter blackmail. But it's a blackmail that works both ways because the CEO has been pounding them to make his or her number forever. So this is not an R&D problem. This is a go-to-market problem. Okay? That, that's where this thing actually gets killed. And here was the big aha. Innovation is not a funnel. It is an hourglass. That's, 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 the, tweet, that's the tweetable remark for those of you on hashtag you know, startups. Or whatever. <laughs> because... because be, we can have as many things as you want in H3 and as many things you want in H1. H2 is the problem statement. So if you look at that and you say, what's, what's the H2 challenge and then how do you solve for it? And then I'm, uh, that, that's all I want to share with you. The challenge is pretty clear. If you are going to actually move those stock chart things, you have to create a net new earnings engine that I would argue is somewhere between 5 and 10% of total revenues and looks like it's probably going to go to 15 to 20 in the not too distant future. Somewhere around here, the investors go, whoo, dude. So it's interesting. So video at Cisco hasn't quite gotten there yet. You think it might, might, but it hasn't. SharePoint or Xbox at Microsoft, interesting. Not, 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 not quite yet, right? Don't, don't feel you're quite, quite there yet. Because I think still 85% of Microsoft's net revenue pretty much is office windows of some variation thereof. So you got to get to a certain point. But clearly, clearly iPod did it, clearly I phone did it clearly, iPad did it clearly, um, Amazon Web Services has done it to Amazon, so we, that's where they got that, that one from, okay? So somewhere in there, okay? Right now, when you start, you're, if you're below somewhere between 1%, you don't even show. You can hide. You can effectively be like a Horizon 3 play. So if you think, if you just sort of set that as an order of magnitude move, the journey is I have to grow one order of magnitude, and the question is how much time can a large public corporation give you to do that? I will submit to you that they, they, they'll certainly give you one year, and there's no chance that you can do it in one year. They will reluctantly give you two years, and there's probably no chance you can do it in two years, but if you make enough progress, they will grudgingly give you the third year, and if you don't get it done in the third year, I don't think you get the fourth year. Okay? That would be my sort of order of magnitude play here. So that, this means when you take on this assignment, you're behind. Probably somewhere between three and six quarters. Right? I mean, it's, it's brutal. It's a brutal assignment. Okay? So Horizon 2 is not a stable state. You either get through it or you die. And by the way, that, that's the venture-like thing here. Because venture capitals are not stable institutions. You can't just say, I'll just raise more capital. You know? At some point, those nice, friendly VCs, 
not so friendly, right? You know, oh, hi, hi, no, 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 we're not, no, we're not funding, no, no. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's not a stable state. So, so, so this is the issue inside the corporation. So then the question was, and this is the last slide, this is kind of the, the, the money slide. So, okay, dude, what would you do differently? How would you play this game to actually win? And, 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 and you know, don't fool around because, you know, this is gonna be painful, we don't wanna do it twice. So the first thing is, how many Horizon 2 initiatives can you do at the same time? I, this is the first place where I make myself radically unpopular. The answer is one. Only one. And I don't care if you're a $100 billion corporation, the answer is one. That sounds so wrong to so, for so many reasons, to so many people, that it almost ends the conversation there, except they're too polite to kick me out of the room because it's like, that can't be right. That cannot be right. Look at the odds of these things. But my point is, this is a one-lane highway. If you put two cars onto a one-lane highway, you've just guaranteed that neither of them will get through, right? So the only way to get this thing through is one at a time. Now you can have as many Horizon 3 initiatives waiting to get on the highway, and you can have as many Horizon 1 businesses as you want to run. Large corporations can run many things in Horizon 1, and they can do many experiments in Horizon 3, one to get through the pipe. Second one, when do you plan and budget for this initiative? Not with all the other children, right? You have to, if you're gonna actually get the right resourcing for this, both in the field and in the factory, you have to plan, do your annual planning for your Horizon 2 one quarter before you do your annual planning for everything else. Once the annual planning, the, the real annual planning starts, the knives are out, it's a zero sum game, there is zero chance the Horizon 2 guy is gonna survive, zero. That's number two. Three, what kind of a structure do you need? You need a venture-like structure. The reason why venture-backed companies can kick the tail out of large corporations routinely is because they have this fast cycle time latency that we've been talking about. And, and, and even in B2B, really fast. You know, the, the salesperson, the engineering person, oh my God, the customer said this doesn't work. Uh, you know, I'll try to hack something together. Can you give me a demo by Tuesday? And in a large corporation, it was which Tuesday? I'm booked for the next two Tuesdays. I, I can get to it this month, but, but the cycle time's completely ruined. So, and, and by the way, the sales force is, is, is kind of slightly misdirected and the services people are saying, you know, I'll help you, but you know, my utilization number is kind of, kind of low this month and I'm, so I'm a little bit worried about helping you too much. Right? So you get all these messages back from the corporation of, you know, you, you're an irritant. You know, you, you just, I mean, you're my friend, but you're an irritant, right? So that's number, that, so you have, to, you have to be able to organize this thing, but you can't let it persist. At scale, this business has to melt back into the functional organization of the large corporation. So once you get to something close to horizon one scale where the business can survive, then there's no empire building. The sales goes back to the sales force, the engineering goes back to the engineering team, the support goes back to the support team, but during that, that order of magnitude race, it has to report to a single entrepreneurial GM who can move resources on a dime during that, during that period in order to adapt and grow fast. Fourth one, metrics. Tipping point metrics, crossing the chasm for B2B, four gears for B2C. And the last one, this is the one where, I, if I haven't been kicked out, now that's why I put it last, because this is almost always. So the compensation statement is, obviously you wanna compensate the general manager of the Horizon 2 business unit with high variable compensation on getting to material size. Score, got it. Next, who's the ultimate sponsor of this initiative? Has to be the CEO. Okay, CEO, step up. Big part of your variable compensation is, did you get this Horizon 2 initiative to material size? Okay, that's number two. The painful one, everybody who reports to the CEO, not the entrepreneurial GM, this is not in your business unit, all of your variable comp also is gonna ride on the success of this one business unit that you did not fund and that you do not believe in and you don't even like the GM. <laughs> You say, you, say, you, say, you say, that cannot be right. That, can, that violates every concept of compensation. I, have no, I can't do anything about this. It's all in his control or her control. What, this, is total, this, this, this is totally wrong. And the only reply I have is, well, first of all, we don't exactly have a very good existence proof for doing it the other way. But the other point is, are you telling me that if I told you that for the next three years, your variable compensation program is gonna depend entirely on the performance of this business unit? that you can do nothing to improve the performance of this business unit? I mean, how dumb are you? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't believe that, 
okay? I believe that if you really bite on that bullet, that we'll take this thing through that horizon tooth gap in record speed because you're greedy individuals, right? And you will think of, wait, I can introduce him to this customer. I can get past this objection. I can tell that account guy, I'm sorry, this comes first. I can do a million things to make this thing happen. I can make it happen faster than venture. I can kick venture's ass if I have the entire executive team saying, this is how I'm gonna get comped, particularly in a performance-driven culture. So the point about this exercise, and needless to say, the, the ink is not even dry on this slide. Um, it's a provocative, controversial pushing at it, but, it, but you know, it's, it's saying, well, it's been 15 years since Clay threw down the gauntlet. Somebody's gotta pick it up, so let's go. Okay, so that, so that was it. The, the, the concept here was just, the four things we're fighting against, the innovator's dilemma you know about, it's hard to take risk in big companies. Annual planning gets all the good resources for the, for the existing players. And the temporary financial markets, by the way, there is a J curve here, which is just brutal. And, the, and, and your stock price will get hammered. They'll get mad at you. But, but if that's what, another reason why you have to go fast. But here were the three, the last slide, the three things it takes. So it takes a focus on power, not performance. It's, the, the two are together. But the point about it is we've got to think much more in a committed way about power and not just keep on coming back to, well, now let's get back to the numbers, which is the performance part of the equation. The second piece, therefore, is it puts more pressure on leadership than management. It turns out management is the key to performance and leadership is the key to power. And there, that's a yin-yang. It's a yin-yang. Sometimes you need more leadership, sometimes you need more management. That's not like one's better than the other, but you need both. And then the third thing is, it's gotta be about the tipping point before the ROI. You just, you have to do this if, if we're gonna get, if we're gonna move the needle. So that was, that was the last of that set. So first of all, thank you very much for letting me sort of 